it's hidden, and a lot of people don't know this. No, <laughs> I, I didn't the, either. <laughs> the game tricks you into thinking it's a you binary only choice. have two choices. Yeah, but you can just walk away from Pascal and do nothing. Neither kill him nor erase his memories. Leave him to deal with his sorrows alone. Yeah, which I think is... Welcome back to the State of the Ark podcast. My name is Mike. My name is Kason. And this is episode seven of our Near Automata analysis. Um, there's one thing I want to do real quick before we get started. Uh, this is an experiment I would like to try. Um, for those who have been watching the podcast for a while, uh, you'd probably know by now that we no longer really care at all about views and numbers and things right. like that. <laughs> um, but I am curious about something. So this is not like, oh, we want to get more views on the video as much as it is a test to see if there's something we can do better to engage people currently watching the podcast. So sure. this particular one near Automata, as a surprise to us, has kind of dipped and dived a lot sooner than we expected yeah. this game to do that. Sure. Again, yeah. not a problem. I don't care about the number on the video. Right. Um, what I care about is, are we doing a good enough job engaging the people watching it? Or right. is there a, a better way we can improve the, the format of what we're doing? Yeah, like the drop-off is more important than the raw number. Like yes. The raw number is what it is. But when the drop-off from episode one to seven yeah. is like really 80%, yeah. it's like, hey, maybe... Maybe we, maybe we need to change something up a little bit. Right. And I'm always open to that. We're always kind of playing with stuff. I mean, the whole reason we're doing the podcast this way versus the way we used to do it right. was an experiment <laughs> and, and evolving the content and making it fresh and yes. not making it, not letting it get boring. Yeah. I don't want that to happen for right. this podcast. Uh, so that being said, um, if you're listening to this, uh, even if you're on, say, Spotify or just listening to it audio only, but especially if you're on YouTube, if you wouldn't mind... Um, now that we've seen how much it has dropped off, if you if you like the video and you leave a comment, I don't care what it is. It could be you suck my balls. I don't care what you write. <laughs> <laughs> really don't care. <laughs> I don't think YouTube cares either. Or just write it just something. Needs to be worse. <laughs> And I want so many of those. I wanna, <laughs> that that would mean people listened, so that'll work. <laughs> that'll work. But oh my God. Uh, what I'm curious to see is how much just that alone will boost. Um, uh, the reach to kind of the core audience of yeah. our podcast, the liking um, and, and, and and making sure that they're even seeing it in the first place, that it's even popping up for them on YouTube at all. Right, I, I suspect so, that it's a lot of people just aren't even aware. So, um, yeah, if you could just do that, uh, just this once, just today, uh, just so that I can get a a feel for how important this seems to be to YouTube. Right, I would really appreciate that, um, and then we'll see based on other analytics and things, what we need to do right. on our side to try to like, whether that means making a little shorter episodes, whether that means making longer episodes, whether that right. means, um, I don't know. We're, we're trying yeah. to figure it out. Because so. we aren't the ones who tell people to like and comment no. on every video. No. But if I it works, <laughs> if it works, we might, you know, want to consider that. Yeah. I, I really hate doing it. I know. I know. So, uh, <laughs> but if it, if, it, if it works, then we'll do it, I guess. But anyway, just wanted to say that real quick. Now, um, funny thing this week I was out of town and so I was taking my notes as I was flying back on an airplane at a Google doc open and I was watching the footage via, I had downloaded it and I had it in premiere and I was kind of like scrolling through it and watching and taking notes, but I forgot to open the Google doc again in a Wi-Fi hotspot so that it could update the document. So all my notes, uh, are only on that laptop. <laughs> And they have not actually been saved to the cloud yet. So I don't have them. And you forgot it. Um, but so we're going to be relying on cases and notes for the series of events here. So I'll kind of let you take over that uh, as far Lovely. as like guiding us through like beats. Cool. And I, I, I mean, I just did this like yesterday. So I remember all the things I wanted to say mostly. Good. Um, but yeah, just take it away. All right. And we'll, we'll get into this. So we're probably not going to get all the way through um, ending C here no. in this episode. But no. maybe we could get about halfway through. Yeah. Um, I just, suspect through mostly A2 stuff, not the, the A2 stuff. stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it is meaningless code is what it's called with a yes. C. Um, so first we've got um, 2B getting dressed for war. Mm -hmm. um, and 9S could not tell 2B the truth. This was so funny because 9S had just figured out like that mankind was no longer alive. Right. And he was going to tell them and the operator like was letting him go. And 2B 
uh, well, Nine S never got to talk to her about this. He never right. got to explain. Oh, hey, guess what happened? Yeah, right. Doesn't have the chance. Um, so this is so funny because I've finished the game now, and as I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh, ah, this game's really good, but I don't want to. I don't want to say anything. Yeah. Um, okay. So the operator basically just treats him like a kid, and now we've got like, we've got um, some like notes and some documents, I think. Mm-hmm. And this was so interesting. The number eleven S. I'm realizing how much my notes rely on your notes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that's the that's the um, the operator who is not the operator. Is it operator? Yeah, they call their their operators, right? Yeah, the, the people back well, in the bunker who the operator I'm referring to is the main girl dressed in white. Oh, the commander. The commander. That's yeah, what I yeah. meant. Then that's not what I meant. Okay. The commander, not the operator. This is interesting because this is good to be clarified for a little bit later on. Yeah. Um, but well, yeah, I'm mostly but, referring to the I, I thought that 11S was the operator who was treating 9S like a kid. And he was like, why are you talking to me like this? Like, what the fetch? That sounds He's, about right. Yeah, I think that's who 11S is, yeah. if I remember correct. Because I think she's also a scouter, kind of like he is. And she tells him, stay off the battlefield no matter what. Like, don't fight. Anyway, I'm getting a little bit ahead of okay. you. But I think that's who that is. So, basically, the, qu- the note I have here is 11S. Wasn't that name on the older list, like, as if that person was dead or something, right? So, that's a thing about, I think, a document that you see. But the machines start to be, like, really crazy. So, the idea is that we killed Adam. Then the machines start, like, becoming cannibals. Right. <clears throat> then we kill Eve. And it's like, okay, the machines all kind of shut down. Hmm. Except 9S uses their blinky eye signals to, like, you know, become re-manifest within a machine. But then, all of a sudden, it's like the machines should basically be out of out of commission now. But right. they're back. They're running around, and they're acting absolutely crazy. Yeah. Right? And so, then, the androids are all sent down on this, like, super covert operation. And they're going to... Well, this to... is a full-scale assault, right? Yes, like, yes. This is not, an, uh, not a covert or operation. It's oh, like, I suppose it's not. Like, it's I like mean, like, the, special forces, yeah, right? Yeah, like, the yeah. leaders of the enemy are dead now. Now right. we're going to, like, go all out and take Earth back. And just do kill, yeah. wipe them all out now. Right. So, this is crazy because the androids all start just completely losing it, right? right? Their eyes start glowing red. They start fighting with this weird... They start killing each other, basically. Yeah, it just right. becomes this horrible, horrible bloodbath. They're infected with a, a logic virus yeah. that makes them act crazy. The logic virus, that's what and it's And then called. the uh, the EMPs, I thought that part was pretty cool, where the, 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 the machines emitted an EMP and like dropped all of the... Yoha units and then a 9S came into support but then yeah, that effect that happens that when you crazy. get hit by the EMP and it yeah, sort of like yeah. warps the screen oh, that and was it turns wild. all red and yeah. yeah I thought it was a pretty cool effect that was absolutely wild um, so basically what I put down here is this whole thing kind of feels like a little bit of a setup right yes so we show up everything's crazy like what's going on um, basically you end up having the uh, the black box like self-destruct thing happening again and basically yeah. all the androids are completely wiped out like everybody dies so yeah. then we go back up to the bridge which is yeah. what happens when you die you go to, to the, the bunker the, the mm-hmm. bunker and then it's like oh my gosh I can't believe what happened and we're trying to like tell the commander what happened but all of a sudden people on the bridge start are, getting yep. infected as well because all their and, data <clears throat> got uploaded and so the virus That's got right. sent back up to the bunker because 9S had sent yeah. um, like some logging data or something up to yeah. the bunker. But he had specifically delayed his own, his own and, and 2Bs, I think, which is why they yeah. didn't get infected necessarily, but the rest there of There is did. something a little bit fishy about how this all happens. Yeah. But <clears throat> basically we go up there and we're like trying to tell everyone, hey, the androids are infected. There's this big problem. Yeah. And basically nobody believes him. Yeah. They all look at him and they say, the only one infected here is you. Yeah, right. Right? And he's like, what? What are you talking about? But then pretty quickly on the bunker, all of a sudden all the androids start losing it as well. Yeah. And so 9S is trying to like save the commander, right? The whole way. He's like trying to pull her along. Um, but the commander decides to stay on the ship as it goes yep, down. Go down. Basically the, the whole bunker's done. Well, it's she, dead. she's They're infected all gonna die. too because she had synced. Yep. She had synced with the, with the server on the bunker. So she was already infected with the logic virus. Yeah. So her eyes start glowing red. <clears throat> she's infected too. So 2B and 9S are the only surviving members of Yorha. Now that, I thought that was a great line. Whereas like yeah. you two are the last You're it. members of Yorha left. And it's just like, yep. oh dude, this was, again, it's almost like this 
part of the game is a sequel. The, to that's the, what I wrote. Yeah, that's right? his note. Man, this feels like a sequel. <laughs> it's like a sequel. It's wild mm-hmm. because you play A ending and then you play B and you're like, okay, yeah. we're just going to kind of replay the game from a different perspective. And so the idea that I thought was going to come up for C was that we're going to see A2's perspective. Yeah. Now we do maybe get to see some of that later, but that's clearly not what's happening. It's no. a continuation. Of it's what part. happens after B right. and it's wild. Everything breaks and it's almost like a new game yes. at this point. It's yes. like a whole and new they, game. They even do a whole new set of like uh, uh, intro credits, like a whole intro That's credits right. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. So it's like they're starting a season two or um, like a second movie or something yeah. like that. So uh, yeah, it was really cool and, and totally unexpected the first time I played it. Oh, absolutely. Um, I was actually just talking to a buddy of mine, um, my buddy Bryce, who he was like, yeah, I, I beat Nier Automata. I know you're covering that right now. I just, I don't know how motivated I am to just play the game a second or third time. See, he didn't even realize Most people that, don't. I feel like yeah, a lot of people don't. I know. They, they think, they see the credits, and oh, the second playthrough is the same yeah. thing from 9S's perspective. And so game, I, I already beat the game. Like, right. I don't know if I care about the second perspective. No, <laughs> no, you've only played half of the story. There's a whole continuation from there. And I told him this. He was like, oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. I guess I got to keep... Uh, I, I didn't know that. So if you didn't know that, you got to play past you B because to. the story's not over yet. It's not even close to being over. In <laughs> no. fact, this is... The, the C playthrough of the Route C in the story is the most interesting yeah. by far. Yeah. It is really cool and there's way more fun, interesting like reveals and... The way the story progresses through Route C is just, it's like a fourth act, right? Yeah, so you've right. got your three-act play, which is A and B, the initial routes, right? Yeah. But then you you introduce this chaos that is basically like things move into like a fourth act. Mm-hmm. And that's where everything really starts to, to go to go wild. Yeah. And so that's what we're experiencing here. Yeah. So we he does. He loses control when he gets like something like the virus, right? Because he's sort of infected too, right? Yes. Just like he can well, still do stuff. 9S we're talking about, right? 9S, yeah. yeah. So 9S is the one who gave the virus to everybody. Right, but he he's also in, the one who's not, yeah, eyes aren't turning he's, red. He's not, um, yeah, he's not succumbing to it in yes. quite the same way as everyone else. Exactly. But he's like the carrier of it. He was like... Yeah the first to be infected and then his uh, sinking with the server is what gave it to everyone else. And he got this by, of course, becoming one with the machine network when he hacked into the system all in round A and B. But yeah. Once again, everything turns black and white, kind of like you were saying, like the way that the, his mind is just being affected. Like it's ridiculous. To B ends up getting really infected. And and, and, and she's like, because she goes back down. He, uh, so she and 9S, they get into a flight suit, right? A flight yeah, suit. Yeah, yeah. They fly down, and she's fighting, and they're fighting, but there's too many. And then she kind of takes over his flight suit, and she, like, sends him out of the battle to, like, rescue him. Ah, that's right. And then she right. goes down. And as she as she emerges from the wreckage, she's slowly being infected by that's the virus. Right. She and she's trying to walk totally infected. and okay. figure out what to do. When I, This note, then, is referring to 2B, then, not 9 Yes, it, it's 2B. So everything is black and white. The bunker is gone. No more backup. 2B is totally jacked. Um, A2 then saves 2B. Yes, from right. uh, a bunch she of helps, other androids that she attack She helps her, her out. Yeah, yeah, she kills a bunch of but things. But she's already it's totally late. infected by the virus and it's basically asks to be mercy killed by A2. Yeah. And so A2 does that, and, yeah. but, but 9S happens upon the scene at the completely that, wrong moment. This was crazy. And doesn't understand that that's what was so, going on. So 2B, her eyes turned red. She takes off the blindfold, I think. Yes, she does. Without the blindfold, her eyes are red all of a sudden. Yes. Um, and then, yeah, 9S is like on a bridge or something. Yeah. And he sees mm-hmm. A2 stabbing, stabbing 2B. Her. Yeah. And like likely is a misunderstanding a2 killed 2b it's pretty obvious when you even though even from 9s's perspective like what happened right yes, okay he 2, sure. 2b was dead yeah. especially since we've seen 2b kill 9s on multiple occasions right yeah. that it's like the the job like when when an android is sufficiently jacked right. <laughs> they are they ask for assistance in ending their life right now the idea behind that is that oh well, i'll go back to the bunker and i'll be fine yes but now there is no bunker. But now there's no bunker. So, so it's Tubi's like... So dead for real. It's more meaningful this yeah. time, right? So now Tubi's totally dead, but 9S can't fathom the idea that maybe Tubi asked for this. Yes. Right. 
right. just can't think of them, right? Yeah. So, and when he screams from the bridge, yeah. and A2 basically, like, he, he never gets to reach A2, right? Yeah, because there's um, an earthquake that yeah, happens. Yeah, there's an earthquake. And that destroys the bridge, and he falls. I think that's when the tower shoots up, by the way. Oh, I think Crazy. you're right. I think you're right. That is right. <laughs> so yes. cool. It's because so, of the tower. But his scream, his scream, and his, like, loss of control in that yeah. moment was it, it 100% Eve. Yeah. It was him ex- acting exactly like Eve yeah, when Adam true. died. Just that's like true. that scream, that Gut, like, I've lost sort of the like. most important thing. I'm going to kill everything yeah. now. I'm so like, just this emotional raw kind of thing. Yeah. It was really, really and impactful. I, I got to sort of the beginning of the 9S side of this, because you can choose whether you go 9S first or A2 first. It gives you the choice there. So maybe some people actually went 9S and didn't do A2. Maybe we should have specified that last oh. week is play A2 first. Yeah, I'm A2. 9S. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. A2. <laughs> play A2. Don't We're doing the A2 side of things today, not the 9S side of things. But I did get to the start of that, and his the whole whole temperament is different. He yeah. he's not his sort of perky happy self. No, he's he's very deeply deeply um, hurt and yeah. and crushed and just depressed. Well, his his life has lost its meaning. Yes, and he's yeah. doesn't care what he has to do to uh, get well get to destroy the machines to kill a two and to kill a two. Yeah, he says yeah. those are his two. That's it motivations now it's like that's all he really cares about i don't care about chain of command i think is what i wrote nah, in, my, yeah. in my notes because well, his pod is still like talking to him, yes right? and he's just like stop talking to me yeah like you're not helpful a pod also goes to a2 yes. which is hilarious and, and this a2 was is like uh, stop following me <laughs> yes this was um two b's like kind of like last act conscious act or whatever she could do under, of her own will before the virus yeah. took over was to assign her pod to a2 and within Yorha, uh, 2B obviously has more rank than A2 would since A2 is a, is a fugitive and yeah, yeah. whatever. So <laughs> A2 cannot give commands or issue anything to the pod because it's overridden his that's right by by right. 2B's command and so she's like that was so stop funny. talking go away he's, he's like, like I, I can't, can't do that because 2B told me to follow you <laughs> <laughs> so like she, it has no choice and so she has to let it go with her unless she tried to destroy it I guess but um, well I suppose she could have but anyway it's just funny yeah and and I really love those interactions between really A2 good. and 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 the pod because the um, pod always gives her some risk assessment of like forty two percent survival, and A two is like, tell me something useful. <laughs> they get the pod slowly. The pod I think does start becoming more useful as the game progresses. Yeah, but especially early on, the pod is just spouting nonsense, and A two is just like, I don't know what that means. Stop talking to yeah. me. Yeah, it's she, really funny. She softens up kind of as it goes through her story, which I really like. Um, but yeah, at the beginning, uh, when he gives proposals. She's like, stop telling me what to do. And he's like, well, I can't. I'm not telling you what to do. It's just <laughs> yeah. a proposal. And he explains what a proposal is. <laughs> and then he keeps giving the proposal that she should state her intentions. And she's like, I'm <laughs> not going right. to do that. He's like, but uh, I'm going to have to repeat this uh, statement every 30 seconds <laughs> until you state your intentions. And right. she's like, are you serious? Like, there's just really, really good interactions between a rogue former Yohar, Yo, Yo, Yora unit. Yorha, yeah. Um, and this pod who's following protocol and she's totally not in protocol anymore. Yeah. She's in complete rogue mode at this point. Right. And sort of the clashes between them there, uh, I thought were really endearing, um, oh, really funny. Fun. Um, and that, that's right. Cause a two kept like wanting to go somewhere and trying to, I'm almost like talking to herself, just yeah. like, oh, how do I get to this? You know, how, or not, how do I get to this place? Cause she was never that specific, yeah. but it was so obvious that the pod was like, I can help you. Just tell me what you want <laughs> to do. And then I can, otherwise the pod can't read her. Right. Mind. Well, cause he was so saying funny. in order for me to properly uh, yes. uh, assist, yeah. I need to know your intention so that I can then analyze what would best would yeah. be the best proposal to like accomplish those intentions. <laughs> <laughs> but his proposals were always really either really obvious yeah. or really technical and not helpful. Yeah, which is why she's always like, well, why won't you say something useful or just stop yeah, talking? Because yeah. like, duh. Like I could uh, say something yeah. useful if you would state your intentions. <laughs> <laughs> It was he, just great. Yeah, it was really good. It was good because the pod was like forcing a relationship yes. between the two of them that, yes. that A2 was resisting. Which is exactly what that character needed because she was yeah. totally isolated and alone. Once again, the yeah. animus anima, like the idea of the pod being the like the animus to secret her motivating anima. force yeah. underneath their conscious mind that yeah. like helps push them forward. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, was, it once again shows up here. And, uh, 
just they do a really good job of this. Again, time scale is kind of hard to tell in the game. It seems like it goes really fast. <laughs> yeah, I think but it was a couple be, years. It could be months or weeks of time yeah. in between this when she meets Pascal, A2 does, and all this stuff. But like by oh, the beginning of A2's playthrough to kind of the end of where we played through, I don't know how much real time has passed, but she has softened yeah. up quite a bit, not only to Pascal's village, but also to the pod. And she's mm. just becoming more sympathetic, softer, like just loosening up, being more vulnerable, more open. Mm. And I think they did a really good job in a, in a sort of compressed time span, which we talk about all the time on the podcast is uh, less is more. You don't have to exposit yeah. a ton, mm -hmm. but you can kind of just like see it happen in this compressed space of time play wise. And um, it's just really good. I, I like A2 a lot as a character. And there's, a, yeah, okay, fun. so I should say this now. A, a large part of today's episode is going to be dedicated to responding to comments. Um, oh, yeah. From two episodes ago. But um, there's one comment in particular I wanted to focus on regarding the way women are portrayed in the game versus oh, like the theme one. they're trying to do with Simone de Beauvoir. Right. I really we haven't really brought it up. I, I Yeah. <laughs> I was going to kind of avoid it, but basically Yoko Taro designed the game so that you're like looking up to be skirt right. for a lot of the game. Yes. Yeah. There, there's no doubt it that was done on purpose. a large part of marketing, if you want to call it that, marketing, the game's yeah. appeal came from this sort of sexual objectification of the... Yeah. Uh, well, particularly the female yes. Yorha robots, right? Yeah. Or androids. So I'm, we're going to respond to that because we do have thoughts on it, and I, I yeah. particularly wanted to talk about this. But I, I wanted to say as a prelude to that that I think A2 is a really good character. Mm, I think so, um, too, yeah. Much more so than 2B. And mm. uh, it's weird to me that 2B is the... Well, I guess it's not that weird, considering what we just said about <laughs> marketing and designs. <laughs> That yeah. 2B seems to be the character everyone latched onto with Nero sure. Automata. But to me, A2 is by far the more interesting character. Sure, yeah. Um, and I, I just really like all of the stuff, you, like you're saying, in Route mm. C uh, yeah, with her. So good. I think the story just gets much, much better well, here. A2 is, is basically, the character A2 is basically 2B just developed even further along yes. the path 2B was going on. Right. The way 2B was slowly developing. That's a good way to put it. Uh, and A2 is just further along that path because yeah. she rebelled like years ago. Yeah, right. Yeah. That's, a good, that's a good way to put it actually. So a, that makes her way more interesting. A, A2 you could see almost as 2B had 2B gone rogue and yeah. been rogue long enough and had not basically. had 9S around. Yeah. <laughs> was alone yeah. instead of with somebody she cared about, you know, right. it, it may be how that character, cause she's along the same sort of like line. She was just an earlier build. Kind yeah, of thing, exactly. Right. Yeah. And, and she touches on that a little bit, but yeah, a little bit. Um, okay. So, so do you want to go into the comment or do you want to let, let's not do comments just yet. Okay. Let's get through as much of the story as we can first, but okay. Sounds good. Um, apparently like three shining things launch out of whatever the thing that comes up out of the ground was. <laughs> So like these projectiles kind of yeah. get launched. Um, so then we have some questions here. What happened to command? Number two, go. I can handle, no, number four. No, this is a flashback. There was like, oh, yes. 9S, is it 9S? Right? Oh, no, He's, I remember now. Who is, no, it's A2. Here yeah, it's A2. Memories. This is A2's memory. Yeah, this, this is happens, really good. This happens at the end of that fight with that like ball snake robot that she fights out in the desert. Oh, sure. Right? There, there's some kind of... Um, I don't remember if it's an EMP, but it's something similar to that, to where she goes into like her operating system. Yeah. And she's, she asks about it, like, where is this, right? And uh, the pod explains it. She's like, oh, so this is like my OS. This is like right. my, yeah, my memory yeah. system. This is, okay, so this is what this is like. So she doesn't have access to that in quite the same way as maybe 2B or 9S do. And she's not able to recognize it right away, right. which I thought was interesting. But as she's sort of navigating through that in that little mini game where you're the little triangle. Yeah, yeah. Around, right? She's going on the pathways. Um, That's one. She, there are some memories that get called up. Uh, and well, actually, one of them is 2B's. So 2B's memory got transferred well, to her oh, I as did see part that. of that. That's there. But yes. then the second memory... Pod says this memory is coming from A2. Yes, exactly. And she's like, get out of my head. I don't want you in here. And starts yeah, freaking yeah. out, right? So, yeah. And that memory is, A A2 is called number two. Yes. And, and so the text is, number two, go. I can handle, no, number four. So that was number four talking to number two. 
yeah. telling number two to go and number four was going to stay behind and died because yeah. something happened to command. Yes. Sounds like this has happened before. The whole, the whole, mm. uh, the bunker falling and oh no, everything's dead right. and all the androids are turning on each other and it's this big problem. It, it seems like that has happened before. Yes. And it's happening again. And also, if you remember all the way back to the first time meeting Ane Anemone. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, Anemone. When she saw 2B, she was like, oh, you're number two. Number two. She didn't say 2B. She yeah. said, you're number two. She you're said number, number two. two. And it seems that in A2's memory, she was being referred to as number, number two, two as well. Exactly. So um, you didn't think of anything of it at the nope. time because the 2B is in the name. So yeah, yeah. number two, it's like, oh, yeah, 2B. Sure. But no, she's referring to something else beyond just the 2B designation. For sure. Something that A2 also had a designation of. Yep. So what you're saying is spot on in regards to how would 2B have developed had she yes. gone rogue and been alone. It's basically the same thing. It could thing have been the same character. From really. the previous bunker that had come and gone. It, you know, this has been thousands of years, right? right. Like these, the, the androids have done multiple attempts at similar things, yes. right? To try to... <clears throat> Fight these machines. Fight the machines, yeah. basically. And the bunker was just the newest version of the same bunker type situation that had been done before. Yeah. Um, so anyways, that's Well, I mean, good. and this also brings back the time scale we're talking about here. I mean, this is, I mean, tens of thousands of years in the future or yeah. close to it, or to maybe 10,000 years in the I future. I think 10, something like but that. But yeah. really, really far. So yeah. how can you fight for that long? <laughs> yeah. You know, there's got to be cycles to this or right. uh, new iterations, new attempts so this is sort of hinting at, at some of that stuff that will get revealed more later. But So then A2 had to be like reactivated more or less. <clears throat> yeah. um, and then uh, I've got this line here. This is really interesting. The enemy's memories have merged with A2s. So we've got this one right here. I am a desert test unit created dot, 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 wipe out mankind. Yeah. And so the enemies, um, she's starting to like get these memories from the machine. From the machine basically. she's killing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, that's really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, and then here's one right here. This is A2 having 2B's memories, uh, this line. Normally, you'd be called, but we're calling you, normally you'd be called blank, blank. but we're calling you 2B for the time. Yes, that's right. right? That's right. And mm -hmm. this is A2 having 2B's memories. Like, oh, normally you're called something else, maybe number two. Normally number you're two. called something more like number yeah. two, but you're 2B because you're... The, the B2. You're the, the second two. The A2. Uh-huh. <laughs> that's where I was going. <laughs> is her. But the second two is yeah. 2B. So yeah. that's really good. But she's starting to like kind of, I wonder if she's regretting helping 2B at this point. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's really funny. And then not right number two. We're all here. We all chose to be here. Thanks for giving meaning to life. This is A2's own memory, basically. Yes, this is the, the line that she, the, that pod points out is your memory. And then yeah. she's like, get out of my head. I hate, I don't want to visit this. So she's got some yeah. trauma. Oh, totally. That has really jaded her a lot. And she doesn't want to go there. She doesn't want to revisit it. But I, I liked that line about you gave meaning yes. to my life. Or Thanks to for lives. giving meaning to my life. Yeah. And, and that we all chose to, to be here. We all yes. chose to be like this. Right. But this is speaking to the theme of the game. And we'll come back to it later. Um, but yeah, that's one of A2's like previous memories. Um, <laughs> then I don't even know what this is. There's a, there's a thing. So when she's in her memories, this like being appears out of like yes. black mm -hmm. smoke, but it's like pixels, but it's like cubes. So it's like voxels. Yes. And it's like this being kind of thing that starts saying mama. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, I feel like she's just going back in time backwards through like lots of memories, mm -hmm. but I can't remember. I think that this one ends up taking the form, taking some kind of form and she ends up having to fight it. I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah. but I can't remember exactly what it is, but it says mama, mama. Right. Yeah. And then of course, I think it's to be, I think the voxel thing does turn into 2B. Let me look at this up. Okay, sure because... Right. Okay, I'll... Because I would have been we'll in my notes, up. and there was a lot of stuff I was looking at, and oh, I can't man. remember without the notes. So. <laughs> Dang it, not Firefox. Go away. Because then my next note says, 2B says that A2 and her are the same. That the only yeah. thing that this... The, like, the same thing happens to them over and over. The only thing that they can do about it is to scream and cry. Yes, I remember that line. And that's 2B that talking that was to A2. Yeah. So this is in her mind still, I think. Yeah. Um, 
So after, um, so basically that weird black voxel thing is like saying mama to A2. She slashes it and kills it. And now I feel like that group of black pixels was talking to her and calling her mama, and then she killed it, right? Almost like asking it do, for mercy. It does seem like that. Um, yeah. It's kind of hard to put together at this point exactly yes. what was going on with that, but yeah. But she slices through it, it's gone, and then Tubi shows up behind her. Yes. And then says, we're the same. Yes, but more or less that we're the same. And it's something about... Um, you and I. Yeah. yeah, like all we can do is... Scream and cry about it. Scream and it. cry. Something so like they've been programmed to do a certain thing. They have to just live through this experience of being programmed androids. And the only thing they can do about it is scream and cry. Yeah. And there's nothing. They can't change their actual fate. Yeah. This, this kind of goes back in again. We're diving a little bit more into the sort of existentialist versus um, the, the existence versus essence whole yeah. kind of like philosophy the game is exploring with existentialism. Um, so it seems the androids are kind of on some predetermined path, some sort of fate. And yeah. uh, they're working to define their own existence, to not do what they were born to do or what they were created to do, but what to, to find their own agency, their own yeah. choice, become who they want to be, make their own meaning. Mm. Um, so this is kind of, you know, still c playing in that thematic, you know, space, but, uh, yep. yeah, there'll be more with that coming up later, but <clears throat> then, um, <clears throat> well, at least in my playthrough, I obtained a book called Pensace. Yes. Pen Pense. <laughs> yep. Gave it to Pascal. Yep. Right. Um, and Anemone had a really good quote when you go back to the rebel kind of camp here. Uh, Anem Anemone says, I wonder how much we actually know about our enemy. Mm -hmm. That was just a really good line, I thought. Mm -hmm. um, and she basically, I think she's the one that gives us Pensei. Yeah, so uh, let's take one step back and just get to where A2 went into Pascal's village because yeah. she's she, uh, she had a part that was damaged um, yeah, during yeah, that fight. Right. And uh, the pod says, you need to get that part replaced. Yeah. They should have it in the resistance camp. So A2 goes to the resistance camp. Yeah. They tell her, or I don't know if they tell her or if Pod tells her that Pascal can build with the parts, the, the replacement parts she needs. Oh, right. So yeah. then she goes to Pascal. Pascal helps her. And mm. what A2 says in response to this is, now I, I have to do something for you. I, I, it would feel wrong uh, yeah. for me not to repay you somehow. Sure. And Pascal being Pascal's like, oh, it's fine. But she's like, no, she insists. A2 insists. I, I need to help. I can't, I wouldn't feel right to not repay you somehow. So uh, Pascal then asks A2 to kill a monster that's been plaguing the spot where the children go to play. She goes down there and kills the thing because they right, don't yeah. kill, they don't fight. They're yes, pacifists. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And, and so you end up doing some side quests. Uh, helping some children build like a, a, some play equipment. That one's really um, funny, yeah. And then, yeah, this one where one of the machines suggests getting a book yeah. from the archives back in the resistance camp for Pascal, mm. who might really like to read philosophy. And so this is the book you can take back That's and, right, and yeah. give to Pascal. So it's part of a, a side quest that you get in the in the machine village. Yep. But. So you give it back to him and... Um, it's so funny because the kids, you can see like the children machines that are around Pascal and they really love him, right? Yes. Uh, Pascal says that he would never tell a lie because they were asking yes. him about that and he was like, no, don't, don't you lie, children. You lie. He's trying to teach these, yes. these good principles, these uh, virtues basically mm -hmm. to these little children robots that will never grow up and have been <laughs> children for at least 128 years. <laughs> yep. Right. Um, and it's really good. Uh, but in that, you can also see some moment there's some some like brief moments of pascal just kind of like chilling like some cutscenes. pascal's reading a book he's reading pensee he's reading a book from nietzsche nietzsche That's where this quote the nietzsche kind quote of comes up. from this yeah now <clears throat> i didn't write down the the quote that pascal says i wrote down the whole quote from thus big zarathustra oh right so basically um the quote that he quotes is um it's the part about superfluous. Where superfluous. There, yeah. um, there where the state ceaseth, there only commenceth the man who is not superfluous. Yes. There commenceth the song of the necessary ones, the single and irreplaceable melody. And then this is where Pascal is like, wow, Nietzsche was a deep thinker or totally crazy. <laughs> <laughs> One of the two. I yeah. Don't know. Well, what I really liked about <gasps> the end of that was, oh, well, um, I shouldn't spend my time buried in these books. 
I should I go have, out. I have a line about and that. live experiences. Yes, right. Which I'll get into in a minute, but I'll let you finish up with. But the, that's Nietzsche. That yes. that's a Nietzschean idea. Right. So the full quote that um, Pascal was reading the the Spig Zarathustra, and the full quote is: "Open still remaineth a free life for great souls. Verily, he who possesseth little is so much the less possessed. Blessed be moderate poverty. There, where the state ceaseth." There only commenceth the man who is not superfluous. Mm. There commenceth the song of the necessary ones, the single and irreplaceable melody. Um, so it's really good when he yeah. talks about when moderate you get the first poverty. Part of that of that quote, it, it helps a lot. Puts a lot more context <laughs> into the quote. Yeah. yeah, open remaineth a free life for great souls. So if you're a soul that is absorbed in your surroundings. You are your surroundings. You're not an individual. Yes. You're just part of whatever you happen to be surrounded with, yeah. whatever you consume, whatever media it is, whatever the people around you are. You're just one of the people. And he's saying that there is still a free life, that most of these people are not living free lives, basically. Yes. The only people who actually live free lives are the people who rise above their, their circumstances, mm -hmm. right? The people who actually are okay with poverty. He says moderate poverty. Right, because if you don't have much, then you aren't possessed by much. Yes. And it's so funny to think about that—the idea that things can possess you. Carl Jung, of course, talked about this famously. He said that uh, people don't have ideas; ideas have people. Yes. Right? Right. Um, also, the idea of like if you have a really expensive item and you spend a lot of time just protecting it, caring for it, you're always thinking about it. Um, it's you're a slave. The item owns you. You yes. don't own the item. That yes. item owns you. Yes. Like it, whether it's a, I don't know. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a video game. It could be a guitar. It could be a house. It could be all sorts of things. You know, this is actually they own you more than yeah. you own them if they're consuming your life. Yeah, this is more what my reading of what the One Ring in Lord of the Rings represents. Ah, interesting. Versus everyone at, uh, at the time of Tolkien's writing, with that this was the, the atomic weapons, bomb. This yeah. was a representation. And he 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 famously denounced that. He's like, yes. no, I'm not making analogies to and metaphors to real life. To like stop it. Recent <laughs> events. Yeah, he's yeah. telling a much bigger story than yeah. just the '40s. You know? Yeah, and and I feel like that that's more what the Ring represented to me as I was reading those stories. Uh, was this idea yeah. that like the more you have, the richer you are, like the more you're really possessed exactly. by the things you have and, and you're not really very free. They become to be heavy, right? They yes, start to weigh burden, you down, a burden, right? Because yeah. you're carrying those burdens with you and you're so possessed by them. They control you. They inform your reactions. Yeah. If you ever like, if you have a loving relationship with someone and that person accidentally breaks your really nice thing that you like, yes. you are going to lash out at them yes. in a way that... It's not It's not you to do that. It's not the true you, the one that you want to be. It's the you that is possessed by that item that got broken. Yeah. That's the you that is now lashing out at this other person, right? <laughs> this, and uh, it's weird to think of possession in that way. Yes. But we, like as a Hewitt Nietzsche would say, we are meant to consume items. Items aren't meant to consume us, Yeah. right? right. So if the apple is consuming you, there's a problem. Yes. You've screwed something up. You're right. beholden to an apple. Like... It doesn't have to be an apple. It could be anything. anything. Gold, money. Yeah. If you aren't supposed to consume the money, if the money consumes you, yes. then you've reversed the process and you're now a slave. Right. That's exactly right. Yeah. And this actually just popped into my head because <laughs> we were just watching the Simpsons movie the other day. Oh, what? The one from like <laughs> um, 20 years ago? Yeah, I can't remember when it Morgan's came out. It, it probably was like 2007-ish. Like okay, yeah. That, yeah, that one. one. Yeah. Like 15 um, years ago. Th there's a, a part of the subplot of the movie well, the movie is like the the, the lake is being um, polluted to the point of like uh, no yeah. return or whatever. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's like the the a plot of the movie, uh, and then they, they they put a dome. The U.S. government puts a dome over the town, and they can't get out. But um, there's a subplot there with Bart, where like he notices the way his dad interacts with him versus the way his neighbor Ned Flanders interacts with his kids, oh, right? Yeah. And he starts to see like how. Um, Ned like genuinely loves his children and he starts to become like envious of that or, or like I wish my dad you know treated mm -hmm. me like this because they'll have interactions with Bart and, uh, with Homer traditionally he gets angry at Bart and he strangles him right like, oh, and he's just like choking him yes like, that's the something. classic right yeah. and so there's a scene where Ned Flanders takes Bart fishing mm -hmm. and Bart loses the rod it pulls and out of his hand and Ned yeah. Flanders says, Oh no, my good rod. And Bart just 
instinctively starts choking, expecting to be choked. <laughs> and it doesn't happen. And he's like, wait a minute. And he stops and he looks at Ned and Ned's like not that upset. Yeah. And he like talks to him about like, oh, you know, it's just the thing. And Things, it's exactly items. this concept. Yeah. Ned Flanders is not consumed by his possessions. That's right? so good. I love that too. That's that's so funny. You yeah. know, I actually have not seen that movie. It's a good movie. I just remember when it came out. I was actually on my mission when it came yeah, out. And it's, I, just, it's, I, I was too actually. Yeah, but it, was, it was really good. A really good movie. So um, Nietzsche would say that the top, the alpha, the uber mensch is the one who consumes and is not consumed, right? Yes. So the one who nothing consumes you, because even in a relationship with somebody else, it's like, and this is, this could be a critique of Nietzsche as well, but the one who you don't ever allow yourself to be consumed, you're the one who consumes, right? Right. Now that could have negative consequences for yourself or for the world. Um, yeah. But that's like a, a good way of thinking about it. Mm -hmm. But another thing here is um, uh, Pascal then says, I must go see the world instead of burying my head in books. Um, that's a huge message from Nietzsche, right? Like one of the things that Nietzsche talks about is to stop reading philosophers, like to stop taking philosophers so seriously, so seriously right? Yes. Which is really good. Um, he basically is like, whenever you read a book, you're, letting somebody else fill your head with ideas, which means you're becoming a slave. You're, you're almost being consumed by that other person right. just through a book, which is like almost pathetic in yes. Nietzsche's mind, right? <laughs> like what? You're allowing a dead person to consume you? Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah, you right. need to develop your own thoughts, rise above that. Right. You're the consumer. You're not the consumed. Right. Um, and he, so Nietzsche would say, you've got to go for a walk in the forest. Like go think your own ideas, make your own stuff. Don't yes. like be... Uh, don't be beholden to these ideas from other people. And you can't get away from that to some extent. Yes. But this has been really good for me. Um, reading Nietzsche, you know, what, back a year or two ago, two, when did, when Zeno, did, when did Zeno, Zeno Gears? Gears yeah. yeah, that was like, yeah, 2021, 20, yeah. I can't remember what year it was. But. It was a really good um, exercise for me in this kind of thing. Like Nietzsche's all about becoming something and not just like thinking things. Yeah. And I'm a thinker. I love thinking. I love reading what other people think. And I love yeah. adopting other people's thoughts. And I love to... <laughs> To mix other people's thoughts with my own and create a new thing. Um, and Nietzsche is saying like, dude, you've got to do stuff. Otherwise you're living a wasted life. Right. Yeah. You know, this actually reminds me, I can't remember which podcast series we were doing this for, but like sort of the <coughs> Eastern version of this, um, we were talking about the Dalai Lama, I think. Oh yeah. yeah. And how Tibet. it's about not having attachments. That's living, right. Yeah. Living um, where you are, uh, allow yourself to express and feel love but yeah. to not become attached to anything. Right. And um, I, I feel like that's sort of a similar, maybe like Western version of the idea hmm. is uh, uh, kind, of, kind of like you're saying, not to be consumed don't be by consumed. things. Now, right. you would also say, don't, also don't consume too much. Yes. Yeah, Nietzsche doesn't say sure. that. That's not what Nietzsche's saying. <laughs> Nietzsche's saying, run the world, man. Take what's yours. And that's yeah. everything. Everything is yours for the taking. Um, and, the, uh, you know, anyways, that's had some bad consequences from certain people who've read that from him. Sure. But um, don't let yourself be consumed and only moderately consume. Maybe yes. that's how I will <laughs> yeah. I will te temper these words. Well, and I'm, and I'm also glad that he puts emphasis on the moderately poor. Moderate because, poverty. you know, you, yeah. uh, destitution yeah, that's is not, gonna not help. is not, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you can't survive, if you're struggling just to eat or like have shelter every day, obviously, like you can't like the world becomes black and white. Like we've been talking about at that point. There's not a lot of room for creating thoughts and yes. thinking about <clears throat> the meaning of life when right. the only when thing you, you're, you're consumed about is how can I eat today? Yes. Cause so, then you're, what you're consumed by is the emotion, the desire to consume yes. is what is consuming. you. Yes. Right? right. So moderate poverty being you have your basic needs met. Yeah. You've got but food beyond that. Yeah. You don't have much. And that's, I think that's, that's really good. Yeah. That's a like good the place optimal. To be. Yeah. yeah. And I've heard that too. I, I, I read this sometime recently. I think I was reading a fairy tale to one of my kids and I can't remember which one. Um, but the, I, the central idea was something like there's a rich guy who works 85 hours a week and he makes $500,000 a year. And he never, he's just, he's working, he's working, he's working. And yeah. it's like, oh, look at how much money I have. I got all this money. And it's like, hey, you're working so much that you can't even do anything with that money. Like, what right. do you do? Like, oh, I buy dinner when in between work hours, I get a nice dinner. <laughs> like, yeah, right. You, you are consumed by your money, by your work, by mm -hmm. your situation. By the pursuit of And then there's wealth. a poor person who has almost nothing, right? But that gets to kind of 
do whatever, whatever they want, they want <laughs> with their time. With and their then life, the question yeah. is like, well, who has more freedom? Who, yeah. who is living their own life according to their own dictates instead of, you know, like, um, if you're, if you're always working all the time, even if you own your own business, you're still beholden to the customers. Yes. And so you, you're, 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 um, offering things up to be consumed by other people. Yeah. Right. And then they give you money, which you maybe on, maybe like you go on a vacation every now and then. And that's cool. Mm. You can con- blow through that money as quick as you can, I guess. Uh, but for the most part, a poor person who at least has enough to live and a bed to sleep in a shelter, they, um, can do kind of whatever they want. Right. Like yeah. they're free. They're a lot more free. Yeah. There, there's definitely, and there's a whole story I think we've talked about in the past where, uh, some rich guy goes to a fisherman and tells him, Oh, yes. if you yes, did this, this you could build one. your own fishing business and you could make more money. Yeah. He's like, well, then what? And he's like, well, then you could do this. And he explains you how could expand. Th- and, yeah. th- 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 and then once you've made enough money, at the end of this, like, do, like uh, decades of time, yeah. you can then do whatever you want. He's like, he's well, like, what would you do? Well, I already, then you can go fish. I already do whatever I want now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I don't need all that money to do it. I live a simple life in which I don't have to work. I don't have to, uh, you know, use all of my time yeah. working for the pursuit of more wealth and more money. So that later I can live my life the way I want to live it. I just do it now. Just do it now. By being moderately poor yeah right yep and so i really think there is something to that like i i think there's uh well it's like we're saying it's it's being consumed rather than consuming or i don't another way to put it living your life the way you want to live it yeah versus being consumed having your life dictated to you by uh work by possessions by yeah uh whatever it is that you are obsessed with having right then you get to be your your true self yeah void of any you know like exterior forces forcing you to be a certain way right right <clears throat> really it's good stuff good stuff okay and that's so, that's what pascal comes yep. to the conclusion of at the end of that. that's what that's what he meant when he said all that at yep. the end yeah. go live stop reading books all the time which but read books though you read know? books like, just I don't, don't i never quite know how to balance this to buy books don't allow them to consume you yeah um yeah, then the, we got the children's machines, but, oh no, there's an attack on the village. So yeah. a ton of like these huge, ridiculous, like cannibal machines just start, just this onslaught. They just start killing everybody in Pascal's yep. village. Yep. So the village robots began, yeah, well, they, at they, least in part, the village robots started eating well, each other. Yeah, so it, right? it was like, it was almost like part of this virus got into the village. Yeah, And, and yeah. the villagers themselves began to turn on their friends. And they're eating them and kind of like at the resistance camp before when they, when they mm. inv- were eating the people and they're like, what, the, what are they doing? They're eating yeah, them. that was crazy. Yeah. So <clears throat> they end up hiding at the, the old death cult the, place. The factory, the abandoned, the, factory. The, uh, the machine factory. Yeah. yeah. And this is, um, well, I'll talk about it a little bit later, but you, you could say that that factory is cursed. <laughs> yes. That the spirit, <laughs> At this point, yes. the spirit of something's not right about that. Yes, place. exactly. If there, you go there, something bad's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but the spirit of, um, of <clears throat> there's a spirit there that drives people to kill themselves. We'll just yeah. put it that way. Okay. <clears throat> so that's absolutely insane. Um, and there's just tons, there's like hordes and hordes. So we go a up lot. to this place in the machine, the abandoned factory. Right. And we're like, Hey, let's hold it off. There's like the little kids are down below. We're going to stay up front and we're just going to fight off all of these machines, but they just keep coming like hordes and hordes and hordes of them. It's absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Um, and I don't know what the deal is with that. I don't know where they even came from. But it seems really hopeless. Like yes. the whole situation is just like bleak because they don't stop, right? And you see them coming from way in the back. They've got these like huge flying, flying machines yeah. and just like, oh my gosh, this is absolute madness, right? Pascal has decided that he will now kill to protect the children. Right. Now- Because I, I thought that, actually this did happen, earlier in the village, maybe upon the first visit there from A2, um, Pascal asked or told her that some of the machines- in the village were wanting to take up arms again to defend themselves. Yes. That they were, that they wanted mm. to, in order to continue their peaceful way of life, to preserve their peace, yes. they needed to be able to defend themselves. Peace this through whole, strength, right? Yes, yes, right. This is the whole conundrum of <laughs> yeah. this concept of, yeah. uh, you know, what is the balance between having the ability and the strength to defend yourself yeah. versus you then 
use it to subjugate others or to expand your territory or whatever. Because they were going to get you first. Right. And maybe you're right. Maybe they were going to get you first. <laughs> so yeah. they're, they're, anyways, they're in the machine village, they're dealing with the other side of that spectrum where if you have yeah. no ability to defend yourself, yeah. you're just going to keep having innocent people killed all the time, right. randomly attacked. It doesn't better the situation. Yeah. So Pascal is... Um, Fisherman's Horizon. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> Pascal himself is devoutly pacifist. Yes. But the other people in the village are putting pressure on him to start thinking about defending to themselves again. do something. So yeah. he asks A2, well, what do you think we should do? Mm. And you can, I think you can choose from a different selection of options. Uh, like, I, I don't know, decide for yourself or uh, some other things. But the point is, is that Pascal's been thinking about this. Yeah. And now that the machine village is Basically, everyone died yeah, except the children dark. and a couple of others that went with the children to the abandoned factory. There's almost nothing left. And he's no. decided that, it, no, pacifism doesn't work. Right. And that I'm going to fight to defend these children. Yes. So. However, <clears throat> he breaks his principles yes, in order to do this. has to. In fact, earlier on, the children have, I think, that I, I took this down as a, as a line here with the children talking to him. He, Pascal says he would never lie. Yes, that's true. Good point. But he, it. I. I don't know if at any point he said, "I will never kill another robot." I don't know if he said those words, but he definitely. This feels like he is recanting his that. previous statement, which right. means it was a lie. Yes. And um, this would have effect, especially if you can imagine like children, where it's like they think a certain way about their parents and then they're exposed to the reality that is their parents aren't always perfect and don't know everything. Um, you could think that if the children saw that somebody who said they would never lie lies, mm -hmm. well, they would kind of break their world a little bit, right? Yep. That's true. Now, I don't know what the children saw here, but either way, th this breaks the world. Pascal was holding together the world by his pacifism. He mm -hmm. was keeping the machine village, the machines, the ones that looked up to him. He, he kept their world intact by being who he was. Yes. And go figure, as soon as he... Now, it couldn't have been any other way because they were going to get destroyed. But once he breaks his principles... Um, it, it, his the world is broken yeah. like whether they're destroyed from outside or within or whatever it was the, the what pascal his project what he would the world he was building through living out these principles broke be, either way it was going to mm. break either way so it could not stand either he break it himself or they would allow themselves to be killed the so he chose spirit, to break it himself the spirit of the machine village was now fully <clears throat> dead yeah. at this point because it was yeah. like his project you yes. know and and he if he couldn't hold it up it's dead right the world is now gone they need a new world so um basically he becomes a monster yes in order to protect the children right. and there's a sick kaiju fight that happens right yes, so it's right. really fun it's really cool um and we end up winning the, despite all the odds you know we're able to um to uh, fight back the robots. Uh, and then we decide, okay, let's go check on the children, right? Yes. So we got to get in the ro get in the elevator, go down to the place where people kill themselves. Last time we were there. Although this is A2, so I don't think she Yeah, was A2 wasn't there last time. There she last wasn't time. there. So mm -hmm. she doesn't know, but there is a ghost. <laughs> that place is haunted, <laughs> and it drives people to do things. So once they get down and check on the kids, it turns out the kids are all dead. Um, and not only that they're all dead, that they are self-inflictedly dead. Yes. They killed themselves. Right. Um, I don't know how they knew what was going on while I, they were I, well, down there. I think, well, because you you go inside of the building, and the killed the kids are there. Yeah. And then uh, there are some machines that get in, and A two fights them off real uh, quick. And, and then, then they're there's kind of a door that's the next opened, place. and you just see all these machines coming. Huh. So I think they knew. <laughs> they probably saw that an, a freaking huge army of machines and it are did, coming to kill it us. It did all. look hopeless. Yeah, that, uh, that's the word that I could choose at the beginning when we start fighting off these robots. Hopeless is the word that comes to my mind. Yeah. So the kids had that same kind of like idea. Right. This is hopeless. What yes. do you do when something's hopeless? Well, something about what Pascal taught them. Yeah. Led them to do this because Pascal feels very much responsible. Yes. As soon as Pascal sees them, he goes, oh my gosh, he taught the children what fear was. But that fear is what caused them to die, to kill themselves. Yeah, they killed um, themselves rather than waiting for the machines to come eat them or right. some other worse fate. They took right. fate into their own hands for yeah. that last moment. Um, but is that is this right, though? Can you explain maybe in your own words, like what exactly okay. happened here? Because yeah. there's, I have some questions. Okay, so 
A2 goes there. Pascal is with the children. They're kind of like, there's just like a, a door that opens, right? And they're all kind of in a room. And there's a couple of other machines there, but not very many. Mostly it's just kids and Pascal. Hmm. So uh, as, as you're sitting there like explaining what happened, as Pascal's explaining what happened in the village, this is where Pascal explains some of our own people just went crazy all of a sudden and started killing each other and yeah. all this. Then there are machines that get into that room because the door's open, right? And so A2 fights them off and then they see all the ones coming. Yeah. And it's like, okay, this is where Pascal decides I'm going to fight. Um, I think A2 goes onto a platform, fights for all, but then Pascal gets into one of the angles, like... Oh, the, that's right. The giant that's right. ones. And that's the kaiju fight. That's yeah. right. And then you start and, fighting that water fight. That was like so cool. Punching all these things. And then there's oh, a battle so again from an angles and then a Pascal and an angles. It's it's almost like a side scrolling, almost like a like a fight, you know, like a fighter, mm. like a two D fighter side scroll from yeah. the side view. And you're like beating a you fetch out of it. Throw these slow punches. Yeah. <laughs> and so after he finishes wiping out and and i mean while doing this pascal is also saying like i'll kill you all yep, yep. and things he like breaks. this he totally breaks um like <clears throat> this isn't just a defense this is like a a violent rage that yeah. comes over him like a almost like a pleasure not yeah no, maybe maybe you could sure. say pleasure in in the killing itself yeah like and there's a whole aspect of this we haven't touched on no, yet not too. yet because there's a million things to talk about in this game and, mm -hmm. and some people become impatient, but it's like, we will get there. Just like, <laughs> you have to realize we talk about, we're talking for like an hour and a half. We can't <laughs> say everything all in one time or in one go. So anyways, we'll get to that later. But um, the important thing is then Pascal goes back and it's in going back inside and seeing all the kids dead. They killed themselves and Pascal's now the only one left that Pascal breaks down completely. Yeah. And this is where Pascal asks A2 to either erase his memories or kill him because he cannot take he it. Can't he abide. cannot, he cannot yeah. handle this heartbreak. It's too much. But before we go into that too much, does, does it make sense to you that the children killed themselves? Like, like the how of it or that they did it at all? Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, well, something about this whole how, scene, I just feel something's weird about. As for the why, um, I would think, based on it, the fact that it's all fear-based, mm. that having witnessed uh, the terror of the people you love and care about, your neighbors, maybe even parents to these children, right. turning on them and eating them alive, right. that that is so scary... And I don't know how much pain machines feel, but, you know, yeah. a big part of the fear of death is really just the fear of the pain that comes along with it. Obviously, yeah. the the fear of ceasing to exist is one a whole other thing. But people, That's a different, yeah. people commit suicide all the time. So they obviously do. there's a, a level do, of but, suffering but of fear. Children do not. Yeah, I guess that's usually true. But I, am I anthropomorphizing them too much, right? Or I, I, I don't it's know how possible. old are these fifteen-year-old children? Or I know they're probably a thousand years old. That's the part that makes this so weird. The robots probably been around for a very long time. Um, but for a group of children to mass commit suicide is like unheard, unheard of. of. Yeah. It, it just doesn't happen. Well, okay. But these aren't real children. But, yes. But they're being presented the way I'm taking Yoko Taro with these androids and robots and all this stuff is that they are meant to be representing real people to me. Through well, the they're game. trying. Yeah. I think, and this is a part, I think Beer, Beardma just brought this up and it was something I was thinking about too so I want to touch on it. Okay. Um, this kind of goes all the way back around oh, to 9S's um, observation that it seems like Failure is the point. Like, mm, right. that the machines aren't really, like, changing from a dictatorship to some other form of government. They just do another dictatorship yeah. that fails every time. Yeah. So, they're, like, reenacting mankind's failures on purpose. Right. As if the failure is the point, because the failure is what makes them more human or something like that. Sure, yeah. I'm just yeah. trying to, like, no, that's call good. back to that. That's good. But then also point out that they're not really very good yet at emulating humanity. They're just getting right. certain parts of it. So, you know, there, there's a very good possibility that, oh, humans, in fear of, you know, uh, another invading army who might come and kidnap us as slaves or who yeah. might 
you know, plunder or, or abuse us or torture us or whatever else, right. I would rather kill myself. Yes. Right, but maybe didn't have enough data to to have looked into the fact that children don't, don't do, do that. that. <laughs> <laughs> right? They seem to act like children in other ways, and especially yeah, and the way they are around certainly. Pascal. And, and, and what my point is is that they're trying to emulate children, but they don't do it perfectly. Right. Just like they don't do anything else perfectly. In so their, it made sense for them to do this thing, but they wouldn't. But have, that's not a thing that human yeah, children do. They're not yet anywhere near perfect at emulating. Uh, human cultures and behaviors they're they're getting better at it but like there's still a lot that's missing from the equation they're still machines yeah so i i, I don't that's fair I mean it also just could be the fact that this is something overlooked uh children tend not to do this right. I, I, I i now that you mention it you know it's, it's something i didn't even think about either but it, it is right so um but i mean i, I I don't want to sit here and sort of like write the story for the guy in explaining it away, but like I, I do think that that could could be an adequate explanation. Okay. They're trying to emulate humanity; they're not that great at it, of course. And yeah. so they make mistakes <laughs> like that. But the idea is they were so afraid of whatever those machines were going to do to them yeah. that they would rather kill themselves, and so they did. And the fact that they were afraid at all in the first place, Pascal believes, was his fault because he taught them Too everything that they know. Yeah. And this calls back a little bit to Pascal himself. And it could be a commentary, I feel, on, by, by Taro or by the development team of Nier Automata, to some degree, on Pascal's uh, methods mm. of, of teaching about how miserable man is without God, right. how hopeless, how horrible hell is. And that you should be very, very afraid of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? But that in teaching this way, in, the, in, in your pursuit of trying to drive people to yeah. the Roman Catholic Church as hard as you can, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. that what you're actually doing is teaching a fear that is unhealthy, that is hmm. counterproductive, right. that uh, actually hurts uh, people and, and especially indoctrinates children in a way that is not a good thing. Um, the intention being probably, of course, uh, good. Doing what you really believe is the right thing, having no yeah. malintent in doing that. Sure. But the result of it, and, and I, I have felt this way, uh, we having grown up religious, for a lot of things that I was taught, in the way I was taught, like this is not leading to a healthy sort of like culture. Um, when, when it's taught in this way, and, and especially with how much uh, has been done in different fields of psychology or whatever, about, you know, how to teach sexual, sexuality more in a more oh, healthy sure, way right, yeah. that doesn't lead to mass addiction and other problems, right? Um, so uh, in any case, I think that what this could be pointing at is that this sort of like fire and brimstone type of religious education um, can do more harm then it does good, um, even though you don't mean to do that. And I, 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 that's kind of what I got from this. Uh, I don't know how intentional or not that was right. as a commentary on, on Taro's part about Pascal's philosophy, mm. but I, I do think that that could be a way that you could interpret that on a, maybe like a abstract sort of scale between the game and the between real character. The so <clears throat> one thing I had thought and we talked about a little bit before was that introducing a fear of something, um, it doesn't like do much. It doesn't really help. Like being afraid of something happening doesn't keep it from happening. Yes. If it's going to happen anyways. Right. Right. <laughs> so it, it just makes it difficult, um, for you to deal with up until the thing happens. Yes. And then when the thing happens that you were afraid of happening happens anyways, um, it just doesn't really make a difference in yes. general. And so being afraid of something um, doesn't really, it doesn't really help. Now there's the caveat there, evolutionarily speaking, being afraid of certain things has helped humans survive sure. <laughs> and has helped all sorts of animals survive. There is a utility in, in fear, but uh, humans in particular, we are with our abstract thinking and with our ability to guess at the p possible future and to think about things like, you know, the self and the future and, um, different ways we could maybe die. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> I don't think yeah. most animals think about it. Yeah, probably um, not. 
it, it becomes a bit of a curse and it becomes something that, okay, there is a healthy fear. There's a way of fearing things that's healthy. Animals do it all the time. It's what keeps, keeps them alive. Yeah. But humans have developed this way, t- ability to reason in this, um, this compulsive manner t- um, in, in a way to kind of abstractly imagine, you know, all the different things that we should maybe be afraid of, right? We, we've well, turned yeah. it into a thing that can, like Nietzsche says, <laughs> it's a thing that can consume you. Yes. You can become consumed. You can become possessed by fear. Um, <clears throat> in a way that's just really unhealthy. And the idea that I was um, trying to bring up is that if if you explain to somebody that they likely will not live beyond the age of 80, sure, and they become very afraid of dying, yeah, the fear, the anxiety, the avoidance of anything risky will, will it could be something that causes you to die earlier. Yeah, it could be something that helps you to live longer if you're avoiding any kind of risky behavior. Um, but if you're like the anxiety, I think they've shown this before. People who have really high stress levels tend to die sooner, right? So yeah. if this mm-hmm. fear is causing you stress, yep. you're going to die before 80. Yep. Or not because of anything that was going to happen anyways, but because of your fear of a thing, yep. you're going to cause the thing that you're afraid of to happen sooner yeah. just by virtue of being afraid of it. Yes. Right. So there's that, right? And maybe there's that connection with this as well. Yeah. There's, there's the whole like concept of, um, being capable of thinking about the future that if it's I'm, a curse, if I'm it's not a curse. <laughs> mistaken, most, if not all animals cannot do this. I don't think so. Right. I, I remember I was talking to my brother Landon about this a while ago, uh, like 15 years ago, we saw this nature documentary where a gorilla was holding a huge leaf in like a rainforest over his head while it was raining. Mm. And I was like, Whoa, it just kind of blew my mind. Like, wait a second that gorilla is one step away from learning about clothes, basically. Yeah, right. And Landon was saying, nah, nah, that, n- he's not that close. And I'm like, but why not? He's covering himself with a leaf. Yeah. It's very, it wouldn't take that much, in my mind, for him to all of a sudden just decide, hey, I'm going to le- wear this leaf all the time. Yeah. That way, for whatever rain. And my, basically what Landon explained to me was that the gorilla only cares while it's raining. Yes. He only cares to get out of the rain while it's raining. He has no thought that it will ever rain again once that rain stops. Right. He has no idea. And that's why it's a much bigger leap than, than, yes. I, w- than I was thinking. Yes. It's a much bigger leap to wear a leaf around all the time as though you've got a cape or some clothes. Dude, this is um, good. Because <laughs> of the lack of perce- perceiving yeah. the future. And I'm like, well, if the gorilla only cares while it's raining, then he will never wear clothes. Like, yes. it, it's just the gulf kind of widened there. And he was able to help me see that. Yeah. Okay, so I had I just read on my trip just the first couple chapters of 2001 A Space Odyssey Oh, again. it's so good. Oh, I love that book. Um, because um, I, I was trying to get some inspiration about how to write a character as no concept for language yeah. at all. Hmm. Like, how do you write in the first person perspective yeah. a character who does not have any concept of language he does for something job. that I'm writing myself? Yeah. And so I was like, okay, how does he go about this? And I was, I was just basically doing it for that reason. But there was something that really, really stuck out to me as a profound sort of turn of phrase uh, hmm. in, in this. Uh, there's a part where Moonwalker, the man ape, character through who we are seeing the beginning of the story. Yeah. Um, he, he writes something like, then he had, or, or, as he proved to have many more times in his life, a, a stroke of genius. Mm, sure. He thought about taking the animal carcass they had killed into his cave yeah. to eat in the cave. That's a big That deal. is <laughs> a giant. You don't think it is. No, you don't. But that is an enormous leap of genius from the animal world the thought yeah. of i could eat this in, in the, the safety or in of the safety. my cave in the future yes. and protect it and protect us and yes. not be vulnerable eating out here it's like considering Just multiple that variables yeah. is an amazing intelligent yeah. observation to make and yeah. something we take for granted as human beings oh, at totally. this point in our evolution because we've gone so many stages beyond that now but yes, animals live in the present all the time. Yep. And they have no concept of the future. Probably some concept of the past because they learn from experiences. Oh, sure. Yeah, probably but memory. They probably don't dwell on it too much. Right. They're living in the now, right? And human beings in the evolution of our minds have the capability to become consumed by Mm -hmm. the future or the past and to not ever be present. And this is actually a big problem psychologically. (laughs) Oh, it is. And it's, it's part of the 
therapy for a lot of people who live with tremendous anxiety or depression is to get them to stop living in their concept of the future or yeah. their interpretation of the past and sure. to live right now. Mm. Meditation is all about that. Yes, it's all about right. stopping present, your right? brain from being elsewhere yeah. other than where you are in this moment, feeling what you are feeling and sensing in this moment. It's really, really, really hard. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Meditation yeah. is really hard because yeah. your mind will fight you to wander about yes. What am I going to do for this deadline this week? Yeah, yeah. How, oh man, I'm so embarrassed about that stupid thing I did a month ago. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> 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 How am I going to pay my bills? You're, 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 you're always thinking yeah. outside of the present. So it is like a blessing and a curse. It's a two, it's a double-edged sword, yeah. this ability we have to do this. We have this capability to think about solutions to problems of the now that we never have to have this problem again. Right, that's the big that's, one. That's, that's the amazing. Big one. Yeah. But it comes with this other side of it to where you get consumed yeah. by it and the anxiety and all of these psychological issues that come from not living in the present become self-fulfilling prophecies yeah. and you end up actually not living a fulfilled life. So this is a very wide tangent of kind of coming <laughs> back around to it. But yes, this, this is the difference between uh, humanity uh, human beings and and the other animal life that's all around us and i think the thing that these machines are sort of starting to get a little bit yeah is this ability to to like think about the future and yeah, not live in the present right. like they were when they were just mindless automatons that fought wars for the aliens right yeah so well that would be a good explain explainer explainer um a good explanation. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> That's a good explanation for why these little robots decided to end their own lives. Yes. That is purely out of a thought for the future. Yeah. Right? Like, oh, I'm afraid of the future, therefore. And what they end up doing is bringing the potential end of the future into the present. And then, you know, yeah. the, the fear caused them to, you know, do something yeah. negative. And so <clears throat> what Pascal should have been teaching is a healthy way of preparing for the future, mm. not fearing it because sure, that creates the stress that creates the obsession yeah. that creates the anxiety. Whereas learning how to live in the present, mm. but be prepared in places where it's necessary for the future yeah. um, in order to live the most fulfilled life. That's the, that's the hard balance that humans have failed at mm -hmm. over and over yep, and over yeah. again, yep. in which the machines are recreating those failures yes. in the different cultures and societies that they're creating that yeah. all end up destroying themselves or coming to some horrible end. Yeah. And in the midst of this is this idea of existentialism and finding your yeah. own purpose in it versus just following blindly the cults and religions and institutions, right. which we're going to get into later <laughs> uh, when we talk more about um, Kierkegaard, Soren Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard. But that's not going to be able to happen today. We're, we've oh, run no. out of time. We're out of time, but we can so, at least finish out Pascal here. Yeah. But like you mentioned, he presents us with this option. I can't live with myself. Yes. Either wipe my memories yes. or kill me. Mm -hmm. and those are the two options. Yes. Right? And so... I don't know. What did you pick? Well, I've done it a couple different times. Um, okay, one I, This time, I, I just, because I know what happens, and it's almost more sad it's, it, and it, depressing. Yeah, it so sad. I just fetch and killed them. Okay. But, <laughs> hey, hey. but um, if you don't do that, if you wipe the memories, yes, which is um, what I you will encounter Pascal later. It was really sad. Selling the parts yep. of the dead children not having any memory or knowledge of what he was doing. And just and saying, it's hey, just, I found all this scrap metal. Yeah. Like, and it's just like, dude, <laughs> fetch. <laughs> it's really jacked. It's like way worse. <laughs> it's really jacked. It was really jacked. It's way worse. But it's really sad. And when you encounter him at this point, um, it's uh, it's not really him. No. Anymore. No. And so, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but when you e wipe his memories, you get to see some of them, right? I don't remember because I didn't do it here. on this playthrough. Oh, I killed that's him. Right. Well, I believe. I believe. I just didn't think you would kill him. <laughs> so I was hoping you. Did. <laughs> <laughs> I what I remember <clears throat> was that we got to kind of we erase specific memories, right? And we got to see a few oh, yes. of him can, dealing with can, the kids yes, in different ways. Yes. Now I'm remembering this from my first playthrough years ago. Yeah. That's yeah. right. That's right. 
And, you know, yeah, you'd rather not relive the memories that you're about to erase yet from the player's perspective because it just makes it sadder. But, you know, as the game designer decided, they were going to make it really impactful by doing that. So, um, anyways, it was really interesting, though. And then 9S wakes up, and that's where we... Uh, yeah, start the 9S. Start the 9S part. run. Now, before we jump into a couple comments here, okay, I want to make sure I'm not wrong about this. Is there a third option for Pascal? Is there a way to make him two. face his? Is there a way to make him face his problems? I, I seem to remember there being this hidden third way. Is is that right or am I wrong? Okay, yeah. So you you it, would this be that you select kill, but then you don't do it. You just walk, walk away, away from him. Drake, that's pretty good. Well, so I guess there's always a third option. Okay. <clears throat> Wow, so, so you, wait, rem remind the game me what tricked happens. me into a binary choice. You don't have to make it. I didn't realize. I, yeah. didn't, I could have let him remain. So I, I forget what happens because I watched this in a YouTube video forever ago. Do you encounter Pascal again? Does he end up killing himself? Oh. Or does he end up having to figure out, does he, I don't remember if the result of away? the third. I don't remember the result of the third option because again, I never actually did this back then. I just remember looking it up. Yeah, if you don't interact with him, what does he do? You never see Pascal again. You okay, never, so he goes away and you just don't know what happens. I to guess him. you could probably go back to that place and it would be the same thing. If you go back to that place, he'd probably still be there. <coughs> I wonder if I actually walked away from him. You can't find him anymore. Okay. Okay. All right, so we need to make mention of this. Okay. Okay, so, and this is actually a third option. Um, it's hidden and a lot of people don't know this. No, <laughs> I, I didn't the, either. <laughs> the game tricks you into thinking it's a you binary only choice. have two choices. Yeah. But you can just walk away from Pascal and do nothing. Neither kill him nor erase his memories. Leave him to deal with his sorrows alone. Yeah. Which I think is, I mean, I guess ethically the best option. Probably. Right. Like, no, you figure this out. You make the choice. I'm not going to freaking do, kill you. Right. Yeah. Um, or, or erase your memories, which is more or less the same thing. Um, and the, the result of this is you never see Pascal again. So it's not, uh, you just don't know what happens, whether he leaves this part of the world and goes somewhere else and deals mm. with it or whether he kills himself and you just never find him again or <laughs> whatever it might be. It's left ambiguous. We don't know, but that is actually kind of a secret uh, third option there. Uh, so. Drake Chandler in our chat, he's got a really good line here. He says, I like the idea of leaving Pascal's fate, uh, to himself. Scroll up. There we go. Um, and you leave it open-ended uh, so that he has some choice for himself. You don't yeah. do it for him. Right. And and that plays into the whole kind of existentialist yeah, theme as well. Yeah, make your own meaning. Make or your own or meaning. don't and you die. Don't, don't, you don't leave your fate up to someone else. Sure. You yeah. make the choice. <laughs> yep. Right. So, um, anyway, another thing. Okay, so this is... Let, let's go into comments here. Okay. But there's... Along the lines of what we're talking about right now, there's just one thing I wanted to respond to. This is the whole, I guess, continuing debate about eternal life that we've been having oh, with people in the comments. <laughs> um, there, there's something that's been brought up by more than one person um, about memory. Um, if, our, if our memory remains the same as it is now, which is not great, um, you know, in however many years it might be, you would basically kind of just forget or the, the life of previous would kind of just fade away. And there, that introduces a new problem, but right. Yeah. And, and, and therefore you could have, you know, greater new experiences. You could have again. new, exp you have experiences again. They'd feel new yeah. and you'd have a, a way to appreciate them again. That feels like a um, lie. Well, a little bit, but yes, I agree. Um, also it really is the same thing as death though. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. there are some people who are yep. talking about like reincarnation, right? Like your soul lives on, but you forget transmigration of souls, but that is death. Yeah. To um, me, 100% to me who I am yeah. is made up from my experiences and my memory. That, that really is it. Like mm. it, it shapes everything uh, aside from the DNA part of it, the nature part of it that I inherited oh, in, yes, when yeah. I was born. Totally, right? totally. Aside from those things, yeah. everything that I think, believe, appreciate, like, dislike has been created from a set of experiences that are unique mm. to me. Yeah. And as soon as I begin to lose those, which I already have begun to lose them. Mm, There's yep. a lot of things in my life I don't remember yeah, already. Me, me too. So, uh, I'm not the same person today as I totally. was when I remembered those things. Yeah. I'm no longer the same person. That's my view of it. 
So if you lose your memories, that basically is a death. It's just a different kind of death. And we've been talking about that with the whole uh, being reborn in the bunker thing. And 9S yeah, is yeah. not the same person she just met a few minutes ago because he doesn't have the memories of when they met. So really, she's dead to him in a way, right? Um, so memories, uh, losing your memories, to me, really does mean the same thing as dying. So without think, death, yeah. without death, whether it is... Uh, the, you know, your, your mortal coil is shed <laughs> or whether <laughs> yes. it is you lose your memories. Either way, I consider those death. You need that in order to have meaning in life. Mm. You, you cannot live forever. And of course, we don't have perfect photographic memories. So my point is, but, but to go further than that, and then this really isn't even the important part of the conversation. This is just a, hopefully a very quick, yeah. uh, you know, just response, I guess. Um, I don't even, and we were going to, we have to go to super extremes to really talk about this. And it's almost a pointless conversation anyways, because it's, <laughs> no one's ever going to experience this. Uh, some people believe that there will be eternal life or that we'll be able to figure it out. I don't know about sure. that. Yeah. Maybe it will happen. My point really is that um, I don't even think it would take any sort of extreme as in having every experience that is possible within a finite universe before you would become tired of living. There are a lot of things I just don't care to do. At all. <laughs> <laughs> but you would right? care to do them if you had done everything else. <laughs> well, perhaps. Then, you'd, then all of a sudden, perhaps, like, oh, I guess I'll try that I, I think there are some things that I just, I just really don't know if I like, would want to do it even if I had no other choice to do anything I, else. I, I challenge you. I painfully, challenge you. Once painfully you, once uninteresting done, but, or, or painful or like <laughs> okay, scary fair enough, fair enough. or just yeah. like, no, I don't think I want to jump out of an airplane. I don't really care. <laughs> How many t other yeah, things man. I've done? That's just not something. That, I don't yeah. know. My point is, I don't think you'd have to be exhaustive sure. about living every type of lived experience there is before you would become. Uh, I, I keep using the word bored, but I'm going to avoid that because that Close seems enough, to be tripping right. people up. Gotcha. You become tired. You become tired. fatigued with life. Um, I don't think it's necessary to go anywhere near that extreme right. before you would get to that point. But anyway, uh, I just wanted to touch on that because to me, losing memories is the same thing as death. It's required that oh. you, um, that experiences remain novel yeah, and that you have new challenges in order for life to be interesting. I have so. one, I do have a rebuttal to this. Okay. So <clears throat> basically, Uh, th this is hard to explain. It's really hard to explain. So I just had my fourth. I did not. My wife just had our fourth <laughs> child. I am now a father of four unique individual human people. Yep. And you know what absolutely amazed me from a rational perspective? We had our first child and I was like, this is going to be crazy. This is going to be a whole new thing. This is going to be, this is going to be the coolest kid ever. Like yep. I'm going to, you know, be absolutely in love. And I was like this, that my first child was just like this. So the coolest experience. So much fun. And I got concerned when the second kid was coming because I was like, this isn't, I've done this before. This isn't mm -hmm. going to be special. And I've never had this experience in my life. But I feel like when it comes to something like the cheesy concept of love, um, that there is a way somehow when that second kid showed up, I was like, it just all hit me again as though it had never happened before. Mm. And then my third kid, and I'm just like, okay, after I had the third kid, my wife had the third kid. Um, I was like, this is insane. This makes no sense. Like, I don't know why. And was after coming out of having our fourth kid now, coming out of the hospital, just like immediately once that child was born, I was just like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing I've ever experienced <laughs> in my life. It was, and I've done this, this has happened four times now. Yeah, right. And the fourth time, not lost it there is too. no way that yeah. you will ever convince me that that fourth time, fourth time was any less special than the first time. Sure. And it is, but it's weird. And it's really hard to explain to anybody. Um, but <laughs> that fourth kid, it, it blew my mind how like emotional and how cool and how interesting and awesome and spiritual and how like just everything in the world just all of a sudden became alive. I was like writing poetry that night and mm. I was just like, it was, it was a mind bending experience. Yeah. You would think that it had never happened to me before, mm. but it had several yeah. times. Yeah. Right. And some of that you could say, Oh, well I had forgotten some of what it was like for the first kid. I mean, my kids are pretty young. We had all the kids like pretty close together. Right. Uh, but there's something there. Um, but I've never gone into an experience where it was that, novel it felt that novel every time that i every single time yeah. and i would say as it relates to dealing with people as it relates to something like love 
mm. that there is this strange possibility for infinite growth. Mm. Like, and I don't know, I, there's no way you could ever scientifically prove that. <laughs> I don't well, think it's possible. There's the whole concept of inception <laughs> or not yeah, inception. Sure. Um, interstellar. 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 That's it. The that whole concept of that movie. basically can bring you out of a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know what the limits are li for love, you know, and I don't want to sound like a hippie, but I really don't know how else to explain it. Yeah. Um, yeah. There is something to this certain aspect of life that seems to me to be absolutely inexhaustible. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 and I want to add that, like, this conversation would have to be had, I don't know, for like months and months <laughs> before you could like, uh, delve into all the nuance of everybody's yeah. unique perspective on this idea. But my view on this, which I will no longer continue to elaborate <laughs> on in this current moment, um, yeah, we'll wait till the next game. I, I think, uh, can account for things like this. I do believe that things like this are very true. That no. that there are certain human experiences that are so deeply meaningful no. that um, there may be no end to their novelty, mm. right? So uh, I think that that uh, can still be consistent with the belief that I have, but I'm not going to explain why right now. We'll That's that. fine. That's we'll fine. have that conversation later mm. with Keith when we invite him back on um, because we're going to do... from the AIIO.io, life right. extension.io, something like yes, that. Uh, yes. Yeah, he was a beast. I really want to talk more to him. Eventually, we will do Lost Odyssey on this podcast. Oh, nice. And that is basically yep. at the yep. heart of what that game is about It's to me. so funny. The, so. the I, concept of Lost Odyssey has been hovering over this conversation for the past I 20 minutes. <laughs> and I, cause I, but it's funny that you finally bring it up because I'm like, ah, I was thinking the same yeah. thing. Yeah, Lost Odyssey. We'll, we'll do that yeah. game eventually and we'll talk all about this. That'll and be fun. It, uh, not just have the conversation in pieces over, I don't know how many years we've been talking about it now. But more importantly right now, we need to get into some comments. Okay. Uh, and respond to there's there's a few like a, a very particular few okay. that I really really wanted to respond to particularly from some of the women that um, that responded um, uh, opened my eyes in a lot of ways to some good stuff um, oh also I think there are some people and this is common and normal I'm not saying anything bad about this some people tend to respond as they're listening and then like, oh yeah that's th fine. and then like, we'll, comments, then yeah. we'll address something that they wrote in the same video, but they just hadn't gotten to it yet. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, there were some, um, there were quite <clears throat> yeah. a few comments about the Marx and Engels thing. Oh, and yeah, yeah. Have it be the means of production, which is something I think I brought that, that you up. Brought it yeah, up. okay. I just yeah. don't know if they had heard it. Okay. When we were talking about it at first, me trying to connect, well, okay, why was Engels made into this robot? Because I was trying to this think about it. This producing factory. Yeah, I was trying to think of it from the connection that Engels had with De Beauvoir. De Beauvoir. And like what deeper way, but yeah. it, 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 th of course the sort of surface level look at that is, uh, the obvious look at that is means of production factory, but like I was trying to find something more to it than that. <laughs> I know, me too. That's, uh, that's like surface <laughs> So level. anyways, we did notice that and he does bring it up in that episode, but I yeah. think some people just hadn't gotten to that point yet. So there was a lot of uh, comments on that. Oh, 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 and then there were also a lot of comments, I just wanted to bring this up too, about... Um, a character from the first game yeah, and the connection with that volcano story. Um, oh, that's right. Yes. I'm, I'm not going to talk about it yet. Yeah. We'll we talk about will that do later. a whole episode. I'm pr listen, people, I promise you, <laughs> we're going to do an entire episode based on the connections between near replicant and this game. Yeah. It's going to happen. We're not skipping them. We are just waiting because there are people who are playing this with us who have never played the first game and they yes. have not watched our podcast on that game. So it yes. doesn't matter that we've done a podcast on it before. <laughs> not everyone watching has seen it. <laughs> yes. But we're going to do it. We will. But, but anyways, there's a whole the, separate story outside of Replicant that you have to read <laughs> yeah. to understand this. That being so, said, I had not remembered that story. Me either. Story me when, either. Yeah. So right. I do still appreciate the comments. Yes. So uh, now, yeah, now I'm, I'm aware. I'm not trying to bash people yeah. by saying that. I know I was being kind of it sounded a bit <laughs> frustrated or irritated. Yeah. But I think it's because I've had so many times now to continually repeat this is not a lore podcast and repeat we're going to do this at a future episode and people being annoyed with us mm. for not making the connections now if you bring it up like oh by the way it sounds like maybe you guys weren't aware of this extra 
piece of lore that's over here. You might want to read that for that future episode. You're yeah. coming up. Uh, that's fine. Yeah, that's I love that. Please say that to me so that I can prepare adequately for all the episodes in the future. But, but the people who are like literally angry or annoyed that we're not doing, I, I, I've already explained this so many times. This is not a lore podcast. It's not about lore. There, almost every other in-depth analysis out there on games covers lore. And this is yes. something you've noticed, too. Yes. They're almost all lore-focused. In some ways, I just, yeah, we're just not as into That's that. just not what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's not what we're interested in discussing. We're discussing thematic content, thematic and philosophy, story. philosophy yeah. psychology, and storytelling techniques. Yeah. That's it. So lore will happen from time to time, but it's not the focus. So please, please stop being annoyed at me. I have explained this a million times. Okay. Now, um... To get to the really good comments from some of our female viewers here. <laughs> oh, actually, okay. And then, <laughs> gosh, this is going to be always be sold for longer than I meant to. I, I actually recorded an, ad an addendum thing oh, while yeah, I was and gone, I, I but get it we in couldn't, time. I couldn't get it uploaded in time for Casey yeah. to insert it. Um, a lot of the people we talk about on the podcast, the philosophers and the, and the scientists and the, and yeah. the psychologists, they lived a long, long fetching time ago. Right. So their fields of study have advanced quite a bit sure. since their time. Yeah. So there are some things about some of the things we'll read in their books or stuff we'll discuss that obviously in a new wave of this movement right. um, are disregarded or no yeah. longer part of it. So that's true. Or the meaning has kind of changed. Yeah, that's true for Simone de Beauvoir with yeah, feminism sure. as well. There's yes. a lot of modern feminism that does not accept, you know, everything that she talked about. Yeah, she yeah. very much sort of disregarded nature at all. Right. Um, it, it, as being a factor in how people develop. And it's been shown since then, and, and I meant to kind of say this a little more strongly later in that podcast. I do believe nature is a huge factor. Oh, sure. And I, I did say it. Again, I don't know if people hadn't heard me say it yet, but yeah, I do believe did. that. Yeah, you did. But uh, even feminism as a movement today is aware of this, and it has incorporated what we know now, what we know now. <laughs> so what we think we know <laughs> About now. Yeah. nature and, yeah. and the role nature plays in the differences between men and women and things like that. Um, so anyways, uh, I, I am aware of that. Just know that that's, this is part of what we do on the podcast is we're, we're reading things from people a long time ago who are revolutionary thinkers, but not necessarily everything they thought was right. And a lot of things might have been uh, debunked by now. This might be one. Okay, here we go. <coughs> this is one of them. Um, that I, I did want to touch on this because I, I feel like I didn't say this quite as strongly as I wanted to. This is from Liliana F. <clears throat> as a woman and addressing the points about gender in the video first, I think having Simone uh, talking about tailoring her itself to what could appeal to him. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I, I touched on that quite as strongly. I think what I was trying to say in that mess of stuff that I was talking about with my first girlfriend and yeah, yeah. Uh, observations I've had about women in my life not having the same types of hobbies as me or wanting to develop skills as much as be around people and develop relationships and all right. this stuff. In, in the thread of that, I meant to make the connection to the idea that there, was a, there tended to be a sort of obsession with being desired by a man or doing something for sure. a man. Um, and that that being a really big uh, part of what I thought this was getting at, th this whole Simone story in the game was getting at with her constant trying to change herself, in, but not for herself, not because she wanted to, because she thought that's what Jean-Paul wanted. Mm. And that I, 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 I thank you, Liliana, for bringing this up, because I don't think I stated that quite as strongly. But yes, um, that, that issue is one that I have seen in almost all the women I've ever known in my whole life is a, it's, there seems to be this motivation to do something, particularly changing oneself mm. in order to not doing it because it's what you want necessarily for yourself, but because you think that's what a man wants you to do. Mm. And I've seen that a lot. And, <clears throat> and I, I think this is definitely touching on that. So thank and you for bringing that up. Other people did bring up the idea that, like maybe men will do certain things so that women will see them as well. That's fine. Both things can be true. Yes. Both things can still be true. Um, de Beauvoir's point is that women 
maybe have more, more burden. pressure. They're more burdened with it. Whereas um, for men, it's more selective. It's more of, yeah. you know, many men just don't really worry about that. Uh, another one underneath this from a, a <clears throat> um, user named Mana here. Hmm? I also remember my parents being more limiting with me than with my male family members. I've seen this a lot too. Yeah. Where girls of a family will be uh, pushed away yes. from things like of playing video games. Sure. Where the boys can enjoy it and, and be just fine and they can waste their time, but not you. No, no, no. You need to. And this whole idea of what a girl should do. Yes. And, and that's not this, right? Um, it, it doesn't only come from a, a, a man as like a, a, a potential partner or oh, husband or something like in that. Fact, yeah. But yeah. from mom and dad. It would come a lot from too. elsewhere. Yeah. yeah. I, I've seen often, that a ton. Honestly, often mom. Yes. Oh, yeah. All, a, a lot, lot of, of times culture, from mom. Culture it, is mostly instilled by women, which is another yeah. way that this whole thing kind of gets complicated. But. Yes. But it's like, <clears throat> but they were the victims of it. <laughs> well, victim, it's an evolutionary strategy. It's just not an evolutionary strategy that makes sense anymore. Yes. Right? Like the idea that women have this inherent value because they can bear children. That, I mean, that's still... Um, important for society today sure but it's not what it used to be which is like you would literally basically sell your daughters right so that you like uh, that's just kind of how it worked yeah, back then right um and you had to make sure that they were as presentable as possible to whatever high status you know male yeah. might come by so that yes. you can't have them be tainted in any way they can't have any scars they can't yes and so you have to really like overly parent them whereas the men the kids the boys it doesn't matter as much yes Kiki Okyo says, um, from my upbringing as a woman, I had a mix of both sides of the situation of both nature and nurture. I was raised with two brothers, but had traditional adults in my life pushing back and forth. I clicked very well with things that boys are traditionally interested in and still am, mm. like, like Legos, cars, interested in computers and games. But I also met roadblocks along the way. It was common for me to get very girly things for my birthday and Christmas, and not to mention the adults in my family primarily aunts and uncles, just asking, are you sure you like those? It mm -hmm. made me question myself a lot and really did whittle down my own confidence at a young age. I'm glad that my brothers help encourage my interests and did things along with me, including times I wanted to try dollhouse and dress up, yeah. and my own parents for being uh, pretty hands-off in pushing one thing or another. I'm just naturally curious and always questioning, so it helped push the boundaries and kept uh, that kept being put in front of me as I was being railroaded. I'm now working in an engineering field, which as a woman engineer, that yeah. you are a unicorn. Like that is, yeah. an, but I don't think that it has to be that way. Yeah. But I think that um, it tends to be, I think a 95 plus percent yeah, of engineers are male. It's a lot. <clears throat> so that's crazy. Um, I hope you're getting paid a lot of money, but yeah. Um, it's a mostly dominated field and has been a tough road to get this far. I can say Ma that, mostly male dominated. Field, yes, yeah. that's what I meant. Um, <clears throat> yeah. It helped that I was nurtured to pursue my own goals that I wanted deep down inside. I'd be remiss to say that I did feel the pressure, though, to keep my looks up, be presentable. And men do, too, into some way, you know, yeah. um, at least when out in public due to the bombardment of advertisements and marketing. It is very difficult to avoid, especially when comparing yourself to others. Another thing about marketing. Marketing is often geared towards women as well mm -hmm. so you've got the influence from from other women to dress a certain way you've got the 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 mother who primarily is the raiser of children uh you have the marketing that is geared towards women um in a way because women make the majority of consumer buying decisions right yeah, in, at right. least in the united states um that a lot of this a lot of this stuff isn't completely being imposed by men necessarily Sure. Um, it is being imposed by other women. As always, there's, there's, I mean, so many layers of nuance to these discussions. But what tends to happen is you, the conversation starters are at the extremes, and you work your way in. Yes. Yeah, so that's that's, a, that's what we're doing now yeah. is is working our way inside after having gone on a little bit on the extremes. <laughs> so. Um, that, that's why I love it. It was this. fine. You know I what I love? I love the, com our comment section so great. And so many people yeah. have mentioned it. A lot of times new people will show up to the comments and be like, wow, this is the coolest comment section ever. And I have to agree. It's mm. really good. We have so many thoughtful comments. I absolutely love it. Yeah. Now there was one comment in particular I was looking for that challenged my entire premise behind my conversation starter. And I loved this one oh, yeah? the most. Okay. Because it was talking about how you're talking about these hobbies that are surrounded around these sort of, um, uh, I don't know what the word is for it, 
uh, like career related skills yes. as if those are the ones that are more valuable. Right. And you're, you're sort of dismissing these social or I I like emotionally connected type skills yeah. as if they're less now, desirable. You, you are famously an introvert. <laughs> yes. And less, you know, prone to social situations. Sure. But, but yeah, like there was definitely a valuation going on on my part where it's like, well, these skills will advance your career yeah. and they will, so they're more important so because you they make, make more money. they make you more desirable as an employee or in the workplace or in, or, 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 or as a romantic the economy yeah. or whatever, but like, or as a romantic, just partner, because just because that's how, and we had a whole conversation about this in this podcast about the pursuit of wealth and like all these things we become mm -hmm. consumed by not really being as important as we make them out to be. But you know, society sort of dictated those skills are the more important ones, but why, why are these skills of, um, developing relationships, being yeah. a, a good emotional listener? Um, Hel yeah. Talking to people, listening to people. That's a skill. Yeah, all of these things that are more related to what the interests of these women that I knew in my life were sort of present. Mm. Why are those less important? That's right. And it's like you had already made that value right. in your mind that I'm the normal one. What I like is the normal thing. And then you're, you're the one who doesn't like what I like. You're the less normal. I was actually doing the very thing I was yeah. trying to in the podcast oh, denounce. Hmm. Um, and so I really loved that comment. I really <laughs> loved that because it would, th those are the types of things that really, no shift my perspective and I, I i love our comment section for this they well, do this a so lot <laughs> um, so thank you and i really wanted to read it but i'm just not finding that particular comment right now oh, so to whoever wrote that one um thank you thank you for leaving that i i really really loved that comment yeah i'm, ju I'm just not seeing it at the moment and so i'll just leave it at that by summarizing and I, and I apologize i couldn't read the name but i i really really appreciated that now, there is one last comment I want to read, and it's in regards to how the women in this game are portrayed. portrayed. Yeah. And I, I, I really like this comment. It is something that I do think is a problem, but not just in this game, which is why uh, yeah. I haven't really brought it up for this game, because I don't think mm. it is a near automata problem. I think it is very much an anime and JRPG problem, yeah. but on a wider scale from that, just a media problem on a broader sense. Hmm. I think that a lot of TV shows, movies, stories, primarily a lot of them written by men, hmm. tend to not give a lot of agency to women and do tend right. to use them more as an archetype that could be likened to an object that is hmm. just a... Uh, a plot it's device. A or, plot device yeah. to advance yeah. the yeah. character yeah. progression of the male main hero. Right. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and in a game like this, where many, if not most of, the main characters are female. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Huh? Sometimes some of those tropes or uh, ways of writing sort of slip into it. Okay, found it. Good. Finally found it. Okay. Oh, fan service. That's what I should have searched. <clears throat> you should have searched fan service. Fan okay. service, of course. Okay, so I have finally found this last comment I want to read. It comes from Apoema. Apo Apoema. 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 Hmm. Don't know if that's a reference to something or not. I don't know. But um, this is what I have to say about the Simone segment. The Nier series is not kind to women. In fact, for a game in which the main focus is empathy and understanding alternative perceptions of reality, there is a strange sense of otherness to the women in this game. It starts with the fan service, or as one uh, could put it, the objectification of women. I don't buy the reason for Kaine's design in the first Nier. Mm -hmm. 2B's design is better, but still pretty obvious. Yep. Then there is the lack of personality of the female characters of these games. Take 2B, the protagonist of Automata, what does she want? What does she think? We know she follows orders, which is a way to say she does not think for herself and that she likes 9S. Why does she like 9S, though? She saw her entire squadron die on the first mission without batting an eye, but the moment 9S dies, she is unreasonably shaken. Was she looking for love? Why? Is there something in 9S that she admires? I see little indication of anything. <coughs> 
it is an in, it is interesting because 9s likes to be immediately and we immediately know why <clears throat> he is alone in looking for a connection he tries with his operator and is rejected and so he is excited to find a more friendly partner however it is 2b who treats their relationship as a romantic one it is clear from the game that Yokotaro's interview and o Yokotaro's interviews that he is very aware of the audience of this game, young men, and is tailoring to be to be an object of desire, making to be love uh, one and only one you in the figure of nine S, despite uh, anything and without explanation. Yokotaro calls the players off, which he uh, often does, but not usually on this topic. When Adam says you want to F two B, don't you? That was a whole other thing. He calls the players thing. out. Oh, calls him out. Sorry. Yeah, that, that's probably what he. That that's was. right. Um, yeah, I saw, that's I saw a those whole another set of comments. So we'll have to get to later about like that to. could have been kill instead of F. But yeah, um, he is obviously referring to you, the player, and not Nine S, who is an android and probably does not have genitals. Um, there are many side quests involving women who are fooling their boyfriends, mothers. Uh, who betray their children, girls who only care about being pretty. This plays on young men's antagonist sentiment towards women, whom they don't understand, but who ultimately choose which man is desirable or not. Right. Which, especially when you are young, implies which man holds social value and which doesn't. Antagonism is the relationship between Nier and the Shades, uh, between the androids and the machines, which we are told are silly, meaningless, and only capable of causing more suffering. So why foster it elsewhere? Yona is almost forbidden to have a personality that does not revolve around Nier, the main character of the first game, who's not named Nier, but that's who he's referring to. Kaine and A2 are the female characters of the strongest sense of self, that have the strongest sense of self, and they do not, and, and they, they do, do that, that by, by being more masculine. Right, that's a issue. <clears throat> I will refrain from talking about Devil and Popola since I still need to finish Automata. However, their appearance in Replicant didn't impress me. So when we got it, we got to Simone's story, I expected more. I expected the contradictions of this game and its audience to be explored, and I saw none of it, neither in the game nor in the discussion. Seeing Simone being portrayed as someone whose only goal is life or in life is to be more beautiful so she can conquer a man is a little insulting. This is the one aspect of the comment I disagree with. That statement. That one? That um, you can't ever portray it? No, no. I, I think the portrayal of it is a is a is critique. meant to be a critique of this. Yeah, yeah I think so. It is not meant to... Uh, yeah. it, this kind of goes back to some things we've talked about in the past where something appears in a story doesn't mean it's being condoned or that it's being, mm, yeah, yeah. this is obviously to me, the Simone story was obviously a commentary on how this is not a way to live and that right. women are sort of like fostered into thinking this way and that it's not a good thing <coughs> there. I, 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 so that part of the, of the comment, I really disagree with. I think the Simone part of the story was very effective and that its entire purpose was to bring up what we talked about and to have you think about that more, particularly when you actually read someone de Beauvoir. So that's the only part of this I disagree with. Um, so I'll read that line again. Seeing Simone being portrayed as someone whose only goal in life is to be more beautiful so she can conquer a man is a little insulting. Yes, but that's the point. Not insulting to women. It's saying that that's that, <laughs> that we, our society pushing women into this or becoming obsessed or consumed by this is bad. Mm. That's what Nier Automata is saying about it. If anything, Simone, the person, tried to be more intelligent, wiser, and more literate uh, to, cap to acquire the love of, so of Jean-Paul. Of Jean-Paul. I like that it can make people read Simone, but the message Mike, Mike expressed in the video, which I agreed with, is totally absent in the game. Okay, so I wanted to read that and say that, um, again, uh, this is something I agree with uh, for a, a, at least a large part, but it's not a near automata problem. And, and you're right, like right. in other ways, the game is trying to make us look at the otherness, how we... Um, separate other groups from ourselves and and yeah. all of this and it does that like you're saying between the shades and the all this stuff in the first game and it's present in other ways but it's not necessarily very well presented when it comes to the differences between the male and female characters there is still an otherness that exists in regards to marketing the game by making yeah. the characters sexy and all this I agree with that 100 percent and it, it's actually something we've talked about not in this podcast series but about near in, yeah, in, in old, old, old podcasts. Yeah. 
Um, it's That's something right. we've That's talked right. about with, say, the design of, uh, what's her name? The, the female Sid character in Final Fantasy XV. Oh, Cindy? Cindy. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. we, we've talked about this a lot. We and, have. and this is by no, no means at all a near problem. Right. This is an anime problem, big time. Yeah. It's, a, it's a JRPG problem, big time. And it's so prevalent that it's almost like a, a, a fact so obvious that it goes without saying at this point. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but you're right. Yeah. It, it's important to talk about in this context because of how much it's focusing on the otherness of other groups. Yet it, it kind of fails in this respect. In part, what I can see from Yoko Taro is that he critiques the, the game, the game. He critiques whatever process he's participating in while still participating in it. Yes. And that was true of the other movie. We talked about like um, his opposition to something like uh, the Iraq War, the events after 9 /11, Sure, yeah. Right? And then he talks about, oh, video games, you just go around and kill stuff, right? Yeah. Well, I'm going to make a game that's like... You know, hey, you shouldn't go kill stuff. Well, how are you going to do it? Uh, I'll just you go around killing things. Yeah. Like, if you're not paying attention to the story, you think it's a game about killing thousands of people, and yeah. then you're done. Oh, that was a cool game. That was fun. Yeah. And But he's trying to get you to think deeply about why games get you to kill thousands of people, but he can only make a successful game if it lets you kill thousands of people, yeah. nay, even encourages you to kill thousands of people, and then makes you feel bad afterwards. Like, that's yeah. more or less what Yoko is trying to do here. And then with, as far as this one goes, like, yeah, he's going to play the game. He's going to market his game. He's going to do all the things that Japanese games of this sort tend to do in order to get... 14 year old boys to play to them, it. right? But he will make you feel bad for thinking that. He'll make you feel <laughs> bad for doing it um, throughout yeah. the subtext and, you know, the greater text of the game, right? Right. So, but my point is, is that even when he critiques killing, it's through a game where you're just killing. And when yeah. he critiques maybe um, the feminine appearance or the male gaze or something like that, he's doing it through, he's still going to include those things in his game. Yeah. He'll just critique them in the process. Here's the other thing that. I also have a little bit of a critique of Taro. It's not really a huge one, but one that I, I guess there's just, a, I wish he would go further with things. Yeah. He tends to like get into a surface level reference yep. and be vague about it. Yes. But by no <laughs> means does he try to offer really much, if any, no. true commentary on it. No. Nope. What, what he, he wants you to do it yes. yourself. Right? Yeah. What, what he wants you to do is go, oh, that reference, I'm going to read that more. Uh, this isn't totally different necessarily from um, Creator Zener Gears. Uh, oh, um, uh, um, um, Tetsuya Takahashi. <laughs> Tetsuya Takahashi. That's it, yeah. He does this a little bit too. And when we read a quote from him back in Zeno Gears where he knew he would not be able to get teenagers to care about yeah. the things he was, to, you know, reading and thinking about. So he had to, to so display he had it to make superficial a shonen anime <laughs> JRPG yeah. in order to slip the references in there so that people like us over the course of however many years since that game came out could be thinking and studying and, and we would get into them and talk about them. Yeah. But we, would we have bought Xenogears if it was some kind of like more straightforward game yeah. that like discussed philosophy or if he just became Probably a not. philosopher himself, would I have ever heard of him? You know <laughs> what I mean? Not. So there is some part of what you're saying I agree with too, where it's like in order to get a, a horny 14 year old boy who wants to play a game with hot anime girls in it yeah. to think about some of the things we're talking about. Sometimes you slip those messages into Subtle. an anime yeah. horny game yeah. and hope that they'll find it. Maybe but I do, on their fifth playthrough when they're 19, then they'll be like, oh, whoa, I didn't know that. They yeah. won't catch it when they're 14. <laughs> yeah. It's not happening. And, <clears throat> and um, but I, my, my critique here is that you can go further with saying this directly. This is a problem. Yeah, I think so. Uh, in our uh, otaku culture here in Japan. We're not um, writing women who have a lot of agency. We're not writing women who have strong motivations mm. uh, or who have reasons behind why they have this undying love for this male character. We're not mm. writing people. We're just writing an object of desire for our... I, I think he could have said something more clearly in the game about that. I see. For sure. 
Anyway. Okay, well, we're done. I, I, uh, An hour well, over. The last thing I will say is I agree that Taro could go much further in giving real commentary on these things that he's referencing or that yeah. he's like slipping in. Because he's clearly thinking about it. Yes. So the ignorance thing, that's not it. He knows. And I do think that his games could be better in the way that they depict women and give women motivation, real motivation. But I think we touched on something earlier that I mm. thought was interesting is that 2B doesn't show a lot of this. A2 more so. Yeah. His critique here. Uh, maybe I'm assuming gender. I, I shouldn't do that. I'm not sure if this is a man or a woman who wrote this. Was it a poema? A, a poema, yeah. Oh, yeah no. I don't know <laughs> if you're if you're a man or a woman. Or, I, so yeah. I'm sorry for doing that. But anyway, y you're right in that making them more masculine seems to be the way to give them more agency. Yeah. There's a whole critique on that I, I agree with. I think that's how the Western culture has and this decided is, to do this. this and is it's why not right. I love Nausicaa so much because yes. that's a movie and Ghibli with in general. a female lead protagonist who is yeah. strong but is traditionally feminine oh, and so not good. made so more good. masculine. We've had huge conversations about how not only me, but like other women in my life hate yeah. how they're writing women to be more masculine, to make them more badass, and that's how we make them yeah. strong. You can make a woman strong by embracing the feminine traits too. Totally, totally. And and we've had a whole conference, so if go watch that because we've talked about that whole thing there too. My whole, okay, I'll, I'll end, I promise I'm gonna stop. Okay. I agree with a huge part of the sentiment of what you're saying. The reason I haven't brought it up is because it's really just not a near problem. Yeah, I, I think you're it's right in emphasizing it here because of, like we said, how he's addressing otherness in other ways yeah. and is not really doing that as well as he could for women. Agree with it 100%. Not on the Simone side, but I agree with it 100%. I just think it's an anime and JRPG problem and a wider scale media problem than it is necessarily near problem. And that's why it didn't uh, occur to me to really talk about it here. Yeah. Now, that being said, in the future, if you want to bring this up, just feel free to bring it up. Um, you don't need to feel disappointed in that we didn't bring it up. Just that's, <laughs> I'm not in your brain, so I can't think yeah. of all the things that are important to you. So just bring it up, and we'll talk about it. Uh, so. Podcasts where we have talked about this are some of our FF15. We did talk about Nier when it first came out, and yeah. Xenoblade 2, actually. Oh, we talked Xenoblade about this. 2 for... Oh, we talked gosh. about this a lot when that game came uh, out. I despise <clears throat> Xenoblade 2 for these reasons. So. Anywho. Okay. Okay, we got to go now. Thank They're you for beasts. watching. We'll see you again next week. See Peace ya. out.